Good evening. Today is uh, Wednesday, Jan uh, June seventh, and welcome to the Battery Park City Committee meeting of Manhattan Community Board One. My name is Justine Kucha. I'm the chair of this committee. Jeff Galloway is my co-chair. We have quorum tonight. We've got an order as I see them: Dr. Betty K, uh, Eric Flores, Marianne Roberman, Sarah Cassell. Sorry, wait. Trying to. Jimmy Sung, and I think that might be the extent of it. I don't know who call-in user is 516, so I'm not, oh, is no, we're not gonna have it. So I do wanna let you know that we have a new member to the committee, but she can't make it tonight. Gabriella is, there, is a new member. Um, she told me that uh, with work, she just got appointed and she didn't know it'd be the first Wednesdays of the month. So this meeting she cannot make, but she will make other meetings. Um, as we get forward in this in uh, going forward with our meeting, I want to let you know that we operate by Robert's rules, which means that we'll have a discussion. I will call on people who raise their hands and Betty, you're going to have to wave at me because your hand is perpetually raised. <laughs> That's fine. I'm just going to ignore it until you wave. Um, and um, I will go through the board members first, and then I will take comments and questions from the um, attendees. If you're an attendee, as Lucian said, Lucian's our district manager. Um, he, uh, you need to sign in, and then I will see you. You raise your hand. If you're calling by phone, you can do star six to raise your hand. And I guess star six maybe lowers it too, but I don't know. Um, anyway, we're going to get forward, started with this meeting, but before we start, I want to make an announcement um, just that Lucian, this is Lucian Reynolds' last meeting. His last day with, with Community Board 1. He is moving on to better places, uh, places that don't require him to be working late at night and um, putting up with all of us, with all of our crazy requests. So I can't tell you thank you enough to Lucian. Um, you have been unbelievable support certainly to me as the chair of this committee, um, and I would not have been able to function without you. So you're gonna be missed and you are so, so, so appreciated. Thank you. And I wish you were in person because I wanted to bring you a cake, but there's no way I could have gotten you a cake. So you're just gonna get my, my un, uh, unbounding and heartfelt thanks. All right. Thank you, Justine, that's very sweet and I, very much enjoyed working with you over the years. Uh, I, as I told you before, and for the, the knowledge of everyone here, my first committee meeting with CB1 was Battery Park City, and my final committee meeting with CB1 is Battery Park City, and I couldn't think of a better way to uh, end my, my career at CB1. And Justine, you were there at the table the whole time. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. So I'm very glad. Um, all right, now let's get going and doing our work, work of the day. Um, so I think um, when Lucia pulls it up, we have our first um, our first agenda item, which is to talk about a remembrance garden for community and residents lost related to 9/11 uh, in association with the Resiliency Development Project. And this is more of a discussion because I believe that you know with the Resiliency Projects, it's, it's nothing's ready to be done yet. And uh, I think there's time even with South with this, with the South Cove and the South um, Wagner Park resiliency. Um, there's things that have not been decided, like gardens and stuff like that. So we do have time to have discussions. We we uh, do have also have time to uh, get input from the community. And I'd like to start the discussion. And part of it for me is is starting the discussion just to note how many members of this. Battery Park City Committee over the years we've lost to 9-11 illnesses. And people jump in and tell me who I'm forgetting, but in my mind, it starts with, um, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting her name now, Cochran. Um, help me, Jeff. Percy. Percy, thank you, yes. Percy Cochran, thank you. Percy Cochran, first and foremost, I believe she was a public member when I was there, but um, she, was, she was the first one I knew that was lost to a 9-11 illness. I believe um, Linda Belfer, who was chair of this committee at one point, 9-11 um, cancer, Anthony Nataro, um, Ruth Omen, um, 
Kathy Gupta, my co-chair before Jeff, and then of course also just recently Bob Schneck. And each oh and Tom Goodkind. Oh my gosh, Tom Goodkind. Um each and every one of them were just invaluable participants. Each and one of the, every one of them could kind of put a chalk of things that they did for this community and, and things that they built. You've got schools because of some of them. We've got um I don't know, gardens. We've got so much. I'm, I can't even. I'm not going to go into that. Um, but it just, I'm getting choked up thinking of it. Um, but I just have to say it's important. In no place in this community or is there any kind of recognition specifically for the residents and this community of people. And it's not just people who are on Community Board 1 that I'm talking about. Okay, we've got a lot of other people who've passed. Um, and I think that it's time that we make something that's beautiful that recognizes them, and I'd like to hear what the committee thinks. So I open it up for discussion. Nobody? Uh, well, I saw a thumbs Marianne. up from, from Eric. <laughs> yeah, Eric, and then Mar Mar Marianne first, and then Eric, is that okay? I just want to say I wholeheartedly support that. Um, and are you just talking about people who've died since 9-11 or people in the community who died on 9-11? Um, both. People okay. in the community who died on 9-11 on as well as people who, because there were people who died who died on 9-11 and then people okay. since. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Well, I'm a big supporter. Thank you. Eric? I was giving my thumbs up in improvement. Um, do we have locations we're thinking of? You're muted, Justine. Thanks, Jeff. Um, um, that's a good question, Eric. Um, what I was in my mind, and I had kind of talked this over a little bit with Tammy also, she was thinking as I, as I, as was I, that a remembrance garden or something along, along those lines where it's not in people's faces, Although as time has passed, it's been 21 years coming on 22, I guess. Um, so people are, have a less visceral reaction than they did early on when walking past memorials or walking past anything to do with 9-11 was just jarring and triggering. Um, a garden would be beautiful because it's it stands for life and growth and and you know moving forward, which is which is a good thing. Um, so I was hoping that the authority would actually come and partner with us in this, because of course, if it's in Battery Park City, it's going to be on them anyway. But um, looking for the authority to come up with ideas and maybe work it into some of the resiliency plans as we're coming forward, whether it's at Wagner Park area or it's someplace in the north and west resiliency. And go ahead, Jeff. Um, I, I'm I'm in favor of this idea, but. I think we also have to remember that many in the community, including probably everybody uh, in this meeting, are kind of memorialed out. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, and 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 so um, um, the the kind of remembrance that I would be in favor of would would not be a memorial memorial. It would be. More, we have spaces in Battery Park City today, and I presume after the resiliency projects are completed, we'll continue to have spaces that are basically contemplative, contemplative spaces. We've always had spaces uh, like that, as well as active recreation spaces. Um, and uh, something that, I mean, I'm just throwing out an idea that something that was Otherwise, going to be a contemplative space could have a plaque or a name or something that indicates, um, you know, honoring uh, those who were sacrificed uh, as a result of 9-11. Uh, um, uh, I, I, I would avoid creating a new memorial space basically for any purpose. Uh, this purpose or any other purpose, because I think we have plenty of memorial spaces. Um, but if there is a, you know, a garden area that would otherwise be there, so you're not taking away space from an otherwise competing 
uh, use. I mean, that that's just a, a a thought. I mean, I can be convinced of anything, but I just put that in as a um, cautionary note since we've had debates over the last couple of years about you know yet another memorial taking up space that's dedicated to something else. I, I would be uncomfortable in arguing for a memorial essentially to ourselves and neighbors uh, uh, saying, well, that's an exception. I, in my mind, it's not an exception. Yeah, I I would have to, and Mary, and I see your hand raised, um, I'll get you, but um, I would agree with you 100%. I think we had talked at one point, um, it comes to my mind, and I want to say that um, Jeff Myhoff was talking about it and, and suggested with the idea of um, if you had a space or you had a, a a memorial, you know, a, a plaque on a bench, or you had something that was there, and then also having some sort of a QR QR code built in, so it could tell a little bit about what it was. Now that's another level of expense, another level of um, management, curation. I don't know what the right words are, but I agree with you. It, it needs to be seamless and fall into the pattern and and the life blood of, of Battery Park City. The last thing we need is another Hurricane Maria type memorial, which is just, you know, flat gets you. I, I, that is not what I'm talking about at all. And I, I just want to add a caveat. In just my own personal view of things. I'm not a memorial visitor. I'm not a cemetery visitor. I mean, that's just me. Yeah. And so it's things that are maybe are not necessarily so important personally to me may very well be very important to others. So take my yeah. words with those, <laughs> with that caveat in mind. Yeah, fair. And I would agree with you on that as well. So that's where I fall. Marianne? Um, also, we need to remember that the list will grow. Yeah. That, you know, that, so there has to be a way to continue to add. So the idea of uh, names added to benches is can, can continue. And it's not in, as intrusive at all. Um, the, the, the other thing I'll just say is that, you know, we were, we've had memorials imposed into the area that really don't mean much to us living here. And this could mean a lot to those of us who live here and come and visit in the future. So uh, that's my perspective on that. Plus you mentioned a garden of, of remembrance. So yeah. You know, we'd rather have flowers or uh, plaques on benches than than something that takes up a, a hunk of space. Clay, I mean, I, I do not at all move away from the sentence or the or the stance to say, you know, not a blade of grass, not on a blade of grass, and not where people play, right? People interact or play. So no, but this would not do that. So um, okay. I'm going to ask if the attendees have anything to say. If you do, raise your hand. Um, and in the meantime, I see no hands raised. Nick, what, how does, you know, what are you, what are your thoughts? Is this something you can bring back to the authority as a concept, um, as a partner with us to do these things, do this? To your design team, really? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is exactly the type of, this is exactly the time that we should, we should have the, the conversation, uh, whether it, it manifests itself as something as part of the Northwest or otherwise, I don't know, but this is exactly the form to have the, the conversation. Um, without knowing kind of more about the details, and I guess we're still kind of conceptualizing it. Yeah. As a general rule, just in terms of like, I don't want to use the word easy, that's not the right word, but in terms of um, like maintaining and expanding something general that Perhaps, and again, this is just me spitballing with the group that recognizes all that we, all who we've lost and 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 continue to lose. It's probably um, from a maintenance perspective and an expansion and a cost perspective easier than something that needs to be updated um, or changed, meaning you know capital expenditures over over time. Um, like the police memorial where they have to come and then etch new names right. down. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's not a small thing, obviously not unimportant, um, but something I, you had said something at the beginning, something that continues to grow and to live with a kind of a plaque or some type of uh, homage to those that we've lost rather than kind of, not everything is just names added to stone, not that that's not one way to go, but there are other ways to go. 
Um, yeah, and I, I wanted to, I mean, until Mary Ann raised the issue of actual names being there, it never occurred to me that this would yeah. include uh, uh, names. I mean, re recently, I guess since maybe Vietnam Memorial or whenever it first started, that became, uh, uh, you know, kind of a standard way of doing memorials. But yep. historically, that hasn't been, and that does impose uh, both the maintenance and kind of a um, diplomatic uh, I mean, how do you determine who goes on and who doesn't go on um, uh, is, I mean, you can imagine ways to do it, but it's nonetheless, it, it is an operational uh, issue. One of, our, one of our partners downtown, you, you know, all well, because it's right across the right across the highway, but uh, the 9 11 Memorial Museum obviously has the memorial with all the names around the reflecting absence. But what they also, I think, unveiled a couple of years ago now, maybe 2020, 2021, was the Memorial Glade. And that's specifically dedicated to folks in the community that were lost and continue to be lost as a result of the devastating events of 9 11. And that's without names. That's just a beautifully kind of vegetated Memorial Glade there that's on the on the the site, but doesn't have names specifically listed. It's it's kind of a, a tribute to all those that are lost without specifically naming them. It, it's nice that it's there, but yep. it's also something that I think that, um, and again, I don't wanna, I, Tammy's not here and I don't wanna speak for her, but I speak for myself to say that I'd like for myself, I'd like to see something here. Oh yeah, and I'm not it's saying a place, I'm yeah. saying as an example of something. But as an example, that's one idea. If we right. did names with a little plaque at a bench, it wouldn't be, it, it would be multiple plaques, not, um, not one plaque that you have to keep redoing. If we did that, but again, I, I think part of the deal is going to be, as Jeff said, um, and I see Betty shaking her head, so I know you're definitely going to have something to say. I know you do. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know how big it would be and, and all that. That becomes then maybe it becomes too onerous, but those are things we can talk about. You know, you get a concept down and then we go from there. Lucian, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I know that, um, you know, a lot of a lot of ideas that are done by committee tend to, you know, there, there's certain things that I would urge you all to avoid in terms of kind of mission creep. Um, and and you know, I think in a lot of ways, um, some of the memorials that you know are probably, and, and even the ones that you you've all worked to defeat were the result of kind of ideas formed by a committee of people that have crept um, beyond what they maybe they could have been at their most um simplest but mm -hmm. uh, i think just in terms of guiding your discussions uh i would i would urge you all to kind of heed what jeff had said and, and try to keep this idea as frictionless as possible um, yes. and provide the minimum kind of ways to be opposed or or to say it's too expensive or costly or you know this would could only be maintained by standing a a, a committee of people who judge who to be added on and and who not to be added on um, those are the sorts of things that will take a, can, an idea and, and, and have someone have a reason to say, we, we know we can't do this. We don't really can invest the time or whatever. So just simpler is better in a lot of ways to making these things happen um, unless they're champion, obviously, by someone like the governor. Um, and then you kind of get carte blanche to do whatever you want, as we've seen um, in the past. Um, but, you know, that those I would start with that. Um, just try to keep frictionless as you're is your design principle or discussion principle? No, that's a good point. Um, I wouldn't want it to be shot down because it's difficult. Because you're right, there are going to be people. It's like, how do you know? Are we going to like look at death certificates? Are we going to, you know, it, if if it's 9/11 related illness? I think people. But again, maybe I'm wrong. I would think who would want to claim that if it wasn't true? It's not like you're getting. A benefit from it, but again, I don't know, but let's keep the conversation going. But Betty, I'd love to hear from you too, because it's always good to have point counterpoint. And I know that your committee, um, took up a whole, like a, a street naming or co-naming of streets and stuff like that. I don't see this as that, but you had reasons and had, had some strong opinions in your committee. So go ahead, please. Okay, first of all, put it down in South Battery Park City because they are much more sentimental about this and it will really? fade with time anyway. I mean, yeah. that's just the way that's, everything is. I actually agree with you. Which is why I also go very much with what Jeff said. Stay away from names. 
I would make it more reflective or quiet space versus worrying about other, unless people say, you know what, let's make it a really celebratory space instead. You know, one or the other is fine, but pick the position you're going to take. As far as names, I'm actually very anti that. Uh, having it across the street where they usually use names, that's fine. That's what they've decided to do. As far as I have been very shaped by my time in Vietnam with all the time that Agent Orange was spread around on their food, on their houses, on their bodies, the government decided zero effect and zero payment to anybody who experienced that for decades. It was very political after 9-11 that all of a sudden we had these 9-11 diseases as if it would be zero cases of cancer in this area, the only place in the world, if 9-11 didn't occur. So it's very nice, it's, but it's a very political decision. And I hate to drag some of that into what is supposed to just be a remembrance park. As soon as you start putting in names and have people dying 20, 30, 40 years later, really? And what's the attachment? There is no way, I, I know medically, there is no way of making an attachment. They decided politically what areas, what diagnoses they were going to accept. Obviously, they, some of them are the most common cancers that are in all parts of the country, so they're not unique to 9-11. But people here, you say, that what's the value? They get a settlement and all their medical care paid for. That's a pretty good value. We'll, we'll get that well before they get their name on a plaque. <laughs> or that you know, I mean that that's it's not like we're gonna we're gonna be evidence to to prove it. Clearly, we're not gonna. I mean that you know maybe that's the answer. Maybe they get their settlement first and then they, um, you know. So yes, I hear you. Yes, there are people who need to jump through the hoops because they want to get the victims' compensation fund money. That makes sense. Yeah, no, this I is understand not the that. Point. Yeah, no, and I understand the point, and I certainly don't begrudge that to them. But I also know it's political, and it happens. It's kind of a one off for 9 11. It certainly did not happen for the people with Agent Orange. Which is terrible. Um, but as far as having names, I say keep it simple. Consider putting it in South Battery Park City, where it has the most meaning to the most living people. That part That's I agree I with. And yeah, and I'm torn. Thank you, Betty. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate your perspective. Um, in the attendees, I see Matthew. Um, this means Matthew Fenton. Your hand is raised. Can you unmute him, Lucian? Matthew should be good to go. Go ahead, Matthew. You're Anything? unmuted, but I don't hear you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I hear you. Go ahead. Did you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I would suggest that one of the chief stumbling blocks here, who's in, who's out, is very, very simple. If somebody dies of what the federal government has determined to be a 9-11 cancer, and they were members of the 9-11 health program or the victim's compensation fund, done. There is no further need for any determination or adjudication there. Um, a lot of people in this community have died from this. A lot more people are going to die. Forgive me for personalizing this. People on this committee and on this board are gonna die of this. Members of our families are gonna die of this. And the idea that it is somehow urgent that we memorialize people who've made very important sacrifices, but who have no particular connection to this community. And then it's, I don't know, maybe, maybe not when it comes to people who are going, who have died and are going to die specifically because they chose to come back and rebuild this community. That is um, unsupportable and specious bordering on a revolting outrage um, in my judgment. So I would suggest lean into this thing and um, there is, uh, should there be names? In my view, there should be, um, cause, and leave plenty of room because you're gonna need it. There are gonna be a lot more names. And the next shoe to drop on this thing, by the way, is kids who were in school down here at the time are now, um, Wendy Chapman's daughter. Uh, don't talk about names that yeah. may not be, don't talk about names, but yeah, sorry. I don't know how she how public she wants anything to be. That yes. one she has raised in public meetings, but okay, no further names. There are kids and they are just starting to do statistical analyses of this um, who are getting cancers in their teens and 20s that are unheard of until your 40s and 50s. 
Um, so it, it seems to me that there is a very, very clear answer here and, and only one way to go. And thank you for. Thank you for the forum. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Anybody else? Okay, I don't see any other hands. So I think that um, we can close this. Nick, I guess what I would just ask is let's keep talking. And maybe, um, you know, when we talk about, you tell us when um, in the resiliency discussions to figure out what would be best and, and put the idea in their heads as they're designing it. What, what, what are their thoughts? What would be simple and easy? You know, cause, cause I think that Betty's point is well taken and I actually would agree. I think South Battery Park City is the spot for it. I think that, um. I'm torn with the names and no names because I, I want the ground rent to be lower. I want the taxes to be lower. So obviously the more costs I dump on the battery Park City authority, the more, you know, the more harder that gets is to get. Done. Um, that said, this is an important issue, and I think it's important to a lot of folks because, you know, I just mentioned committee members um, or former committee members. Um, there's just so many friends. And yeah, that's it. Let's keep talking, okay? Online, offline, and we'll bring this up. And I appreciate everybody's input. There's no wrong answer here, okay? So don't feel badly whatever anybody's opinion is. There's no wrong answer. This is a, this is a topic that everybody feels strongly about. Um, all right, if we can, then jump next, if I, if I, unless I see Matthew, you raised your, no, you didn't. Okay, good. Cause oh, you did raise your hand again. Quick. You have 1 minute Matthew. Cause I want to move on. Oh, you're still muted. So if you un unmute Matthew, <laughs> there you go. Now you can talk. If you're looking for a discussion point that you can bargain away in negotiations over this. Don't make it the names. How about a big plaque on top that says all these people are dead because their government lied to them and they believed it. That would be a good thing to bargain away because I don't think they're going to put that up there. Well, that but is yes. literally true. And, it is uh, true. Yes, it is true. But you know what? The same is true for Agent Orange and, yeah, and so many absolutely. other things. The burn pits, so many things. But yeah, yeah. It's I would just say outrages like Agent Orange and the burn pits we shouldn't be using that injustice as a model to replicate here. Mm. The justice we do here should be the model that we replicate elsewhere with people who've been screwed over by by government lies or inaction or so don't take what was done wrong and say we have to perpetuate the wrong by repeating yeah. it here. Do it right here and then say to all of those other communities, you deserve the same consideration, you deserve the the same support that we demanded and got here. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. All right. I see nobody else. So let's go to the next issue, which is Patrick Murphy. You get to go next. Battery Park City security update. Um, you're going to mute yourself Pat, if you're ready. I got it. All right. Good evening. How are you? Good. How are you, sir? Good. So, um. As far as our reports for the month of May, uh, the graffiti situation, we went from 56 in 2022 down to four. Uh, homeless, our interaction with the homeless last year was only two during the month of May. This year it's 13. Uh, lost and found property. Last year we had 12. This year, four. Park rules, uh, 27 last year, 11 this year. Vendors, it was zero. Dogs, it was 28 last year, and this year we're at eight for May. And slowly on the rise. Slowly on the rise. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uh, homeless people were getting more interaction with them because we've had situations where They've gone into the restaurant on uh, the Esplanade and sat down and refused to leave. On so the outside part on on by Gateway. No, the inside. They actually walked Ooh. inside. Okay. And sat down and refused to leave, and uh, we had conversations with them, and they got up and they left. We've had them go into uh, buildings, into the lobby where the doormen have contacted us. Um, 
And in one case, the person was demanding, thinking that it was like a hotel room, that he mm. wanted a room. So uh, we're dealing basically more uh, with homeless people that have mental health issues than we've had in the past. That's, uh, they, that's pretty much it right now. Are they new people or people you've recognized and have to, who, you know, there's some folks in the neighborhood who I know now. Right. I mean, obviously those that hang out basically know the rules. Yeah. Okay. And we're going into the summertime, so they're not going to be, you know, like sleeping on the bench or taking up the bench. They're going to lay a blanket on the lawn and go lay down on the lawn, which is fine. Because, mm -hmm. You know, up until, you know, one o'clock in the morning when the park is supposed to be closed. So uh, we're having more interaction with people that are either, uh, you know, they're either high on drugs or they have a mental health issue. I mean, we even have some of them, they're sitting there and uh, they have the needles still stuck in their arm. So. Mm. Goodness. Poor people, but thank you. All right. Question for you about the graffiti. Oh, Lucian, I'll let you go first, but I got a question about the graffiti. Go ahead. Thanks, Justine. Uh, Patrick, I, I'm, I'm curious. Um, in terms of the the door, the doormen and others who encounter people who are in places where they ought not to be, um, particularly sensitive places, right? So, like inside of, you know, the children's area of a playground, where you know a, an adult that's not accompanying a child should never be. Um, are there and and then also um, occasions where um, people have entered into the lobby of the building and thus have begun trespassing um, when they're asked to leave and, and perhaps they don't. Uh, would you recommend that people don't call the ambassadors, but simply go straight for the police? Because, you know, being in the children's area of a, of a playground during the day when children would, you know, probably, you know, come to play, uh, or trespassing on private property, um, those are certainly matters that are best dealt with by having the authorities come um, who are more willing to issue, you know, a summons if it's trespassing um, and, and not simply put that on uh, a peace officer who may not have as many resources to draw from. Is it, do you, it, I mean, do you, do you feel like there's like a kind of a hierarchy of uh, or, or like a, an opportunity to kind of push for a different route for who to call on certain certain types of issues that are, are very clear cut, such as those. Well, basically, it all it all comes down to uh, the individual that's working. Obviously, um, doorman or a person that's working the night desk in one of your buildings. If he's always been comfortable with the safety ambassadors that's working and the supervisor that's working, because now we're down here, um, we're here since 2015. So there's relationships already developed. So if he thinks just calling somebody that's in a uniform okay. is going to correct the situation, you know, uh, I think that's why he reaches out to the safety ambassador. If he realizes that that's not going to help, of course he's going to call 911. And just to uh, address your point, you know, uh, when my staff goes in there, there's no touching, there's no pushing, he's not going to put his hand on him or whatever. We're going there and he's just going to have a conversation. Person says, I'm not leaving. Okay. He's going to turn around and say, call 911. Okay. That's, that's where it goes. I mean, remember I'm insured for safety ambassadors in the park and working in a park setting and for being outside, <laughs> not for taking any action or being involved in anything inside. Okay. So we're sort of in a gray area here. We're dealing with that. Now, when you start to talk about the park, how do you know somebody's homeless that's in with the children's playground? Okay, we've had a uh, safety ambassador uh, who was very sharp catch uh, a gentleman, I'll say up in Rockefeller Park, because that's where it was. He had a laptop, 
and he had the laptop pointed over to the area where the kids park was. Okay. Uh, when he was approached by the safety ambassador, uh, he refused to give any answers. So the safety ambassador called the supervisor, still didn't get any answers, and the supervisor called the police. Okay, the police came right away, had a conversation, wasn't really getting appropriate information either, the police, but was able to identify who he was trying to film and had a conversation. So obviously there was some legal matter going on and the man was asked to leave by the police. Okay. So you never, you know, you never know what you're stepping into when uh, you're on the outside. And, you know, you can't make assumptions that a person's homeless by the way they're dressed. <laughs> no, but, but I, I think it's important to identify scenarios because I don't think people should ever try to identify someone who's homeless and not homeless, but places where people should not be because it's it's very clear right. like if yeah. you're in the interior of a children's playground in the fenced in area and you don't have a child, that's pretty clear cut. And it's not about homeless or not homeless. It's about Correct. you're not accompanying a child or or you don't live right. in the building, well, yet you're in the lobby. So I think it's those it's those sorts of situations where I think it would be helpful if we like empowered, either empowered. I think people are empowered to reach out to the ambassadors, and I think that's important. And I think oh, that's yeah, I mean, how it's effective. Listen. But I think just knowing that people shouldn't be in the playground, I think that's the message of PSA that the community board can help propagate. Uh, yeah, well, right, that's true. shouldn't be by themselves in a playground interior area, like something like that. Well, right. Lucian, we, we've already had scenarios. Uh, across right across from our office where parents have come in and said hey listen there's somebody uh in the playground that doesn't have kids there and uh you know we don't think he has any kids could you go out and talk to him and the safety ambassadors have gone out and you know spoken to him and the, the gentleman did leave okay i mean it does occur and mm -hmm. you know but <clears throat> You know, we don't have anybody stationed inside a kid's playground to say, okay, so you're the mother with the child type of thing. You know, we're, you know, we're not, right. we're not dealing with that. It's, right. it's more right. like, you know, we know the ones up in Rockefeller Park at a certain time of the day. I'll say for a lack of a better term, the nannies are there at a certain time with the kids. So the nannies all know each other or the babysitters all know each other. And are there. So when somebody's there that's not part of their group or whatever, you know, they speak up to the safety ambassador and right. the person moves on. I mean, we also <laughs> deal with the homeless that look to sleep in the kids' playground. Right. I mean, and so this, is not a, this is not a critique of, of, of Allied. This is simply, you know, I, 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 what I'm trying to illustrate for the, the committee and the, and, the, and, the, and the members of the community who are attending is that. There are certain there are certain indicators that will allow anyone to instantly know that a certain behavior is not allowed, uh, especially in the parks area. So, you know, everyone should know that there's no smoking allowed in parks in New York City. And I assume by extension, Battery Park City has a no smoking rule, but certainly not marijuana. Um, and anyone smoking marijuana, regardless of their location, you know, that's not something that's allowed, even though it is allowed on the public right of way um, as is defined. But typically in city parks, it's not allowed because smoking isn't allowed. So by extension, marijuana usage via you know, yeah. smoking it is not allowed. So people should not hesitate to to you know call allied if they are witnessing someone smoking marijuana because it's it's and then can you and you can confirm right that marijuana smoking is not allowed in Battery Park City Park. No Correct. smoking's allowed. Yeah, so, yeah, that smoking. includes... so, so that's an easy one. Right. You know, yeah, uh, like if there's if it's middle of the day and there's an adult or a not child in the playground, that's something that a, a person could see and say they shouldn't be there. You know, they doesn't look like they're up to any good. You know, the ambassador can, in a non-threatening way, take a look. And I want people to be empowered to call on the ambassador to do that because that's cut and dry kind of stuff. What right. you're saying, Lucian, is see if you see something, say something, and and the first right, but line it's also defense. knowing what they'll see. If you see it, and like people smoking marijuana, smoking a cigarette, we know that it's legal to some degree. 
but it's not legal in the park and everyone should so know that you see someone doing it. So right. let me throw this out to you since you brought that up, but remind me, I want to go back to the um, graffiti. Um, so I want to interrupt and, and, and say that I've gotten two emails or two comments from the um, community. who I don't know if anyone's here who wants to speak to this in the community. Um, uh, raise your hand, but I don't think anyone's raising their hands to speak on this issue. So I'll speak on it um, and just let you know that people have said that they have seen people smoking in the park, adults, um, ask the people to stop. They didn't stop. Then the person found a um, BPC personnel. Now I don't know what that means because I didn't do it. But they and they asked if smoking's allowed in the in the park. They said yes, it is. And is it allowed on the Esplanade? They said yes, it is. Um, so big favor, Patrick, is just make sure that there's like reiterated to the parks, the allied folks, that you know where smoking's allowed, where it's not, so they are clear. Because yep. when it's not clear. You know, if, if they don't know, or they don't know what to do, then the, and or people hear this from them, it's frustrating because we know it. You know, you you were quick. Nick was quick. Lucian's quick. I know you don't smoke in the park, but I don't smoke, so you know it's easier for me. Um, and then of course they're complaining, like Lucian brought up about the um, marijuana smoking as well, and somebody suggested that um, maybe more no smoking signs. That's to you, Nick. Yeah. Where it's clear. I mean, I know you have the park rules up. Just uh, follow up with that. Um, I'm familiar with the uh, email or text message, and yeah. you know all of this went out. Like like you said, uh, I read the same message that you have, and uh, it was the training for that on the no smoking, and that was all reinforced with everybody on the staff at the time. And unfortunately, they didn't identify who they spoke to. Right. You know, because, uh, you know, now a lot, a lot of people wear the same type of uniforms as my people. And there's mm -hmm. also, uh, other people that work for the parks and for Brookfield right there. Cause I know it happened in that area. So, okay. uh, but I can tell you that immediately after receiving that, the calls went out, everybody that was working that day and every day since, uh, has, has that brought up to them. So. Thank That's you. Been I, I appreciate it because so, sometimes you get new people. I mean, I have no idea, but you get new people and, and training is always the most important factor of everything. So that's huge. Um, I think that's the smoking issues. Um, and the other thing was about the graffiti. So, um, someone in the neighborhood, and I think Sarah, you're aware of it too, because you're on the email, the text chain. Someone in the neighborhood painted, um, I'm not going to say what it is, but it was a, a, uh, derogatory against um, LGBTQ folks on one of the rainbow um, painted benches in South Bader Park City by um, near Gateway Plaza. And thankfully, um, within quickly, I notified uh, people told me, I told Nick, I told Patrick. Nick had his folks come out there, it's painted over. So I don't think the impact on people seeing it was as great as it would have been had someone not reported it to me would have been better had they reported it directly to Patrick or the allied ambassadors because that just speeds it up. Um, but that said, it's just really unfortunate that we have a hate crime going on in our neighborhood and it's starting again. And this time it was against LGBTQ folks and, you know, it was graffiti, but it starts. So I just thank the Nick and the Battery Park City Authority for clearing it up. And Nick, I know I called um, the first precinct. I did not make a report. I don't think anybody did, but are they aware? And is this something they're tracking or you don't know? Yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, I know you had, you had uh, emailed, you spoke with Nick, the other Nick. The other um, Nick. And yeah, I have noted Dano. to him as well. I haven't been able to catch up with him yet, but I will and just run through the particulars uh, uh, with him again. But thank you for passing it along. And as I said, good thing I was sitting down because obviously I saw red. And yeah. um, as I said to you, we have we have all the paint in the world to be able to slap back that garbage. So that's going to be taken yeah. care of immediately. Nonetheless, um, we do want to make sure the police department is tracking it. In terms of yeah. placing a report, not that it's unimportant, but it's also one of those things like the police department has a lot going on. Um, and while I want to make sure that they know 
I also don't want it sitting out there for a long period of time while the police department may have a chance um, to get over here. Not saying they would, but in this particular case, um, we would let them know immediately, or we let our park folks know immediately. I'll connect with Nick from the first precinct um, to understand for next time what the general kind of response rate may be for something like that. I want to make sure that they know. I also don't want to make sure that we are potentially not taking them away from other things when we have the ability to kind of document it and then also remove it and fix it pretty quickly so it's not sitting out there for other folks to see. So yes, then I'll follow up with Nick and I'll let you know what comes of it. Thank you but so no, much. I was I was furious and I'm and I'm glad that you sent it to me as quickly as you did. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I'm I'm yeah. glad it got cleaned up. Um so that was it. Let me just make sure that I I think I saw a comment come in. Somebody had something to contribute. I don't. Yes, I saw so too. So, um, yeah, um, since someone's telling me, yes, that it was bigoted homophobic language. That's the best way to describe it. So, yes, you are correct. That's the best yeah. way to say it. Um, I see that Mary, um, Bernay has a hand raise. Lucian, can you unhook, un mute Mary? Mary, you can unmute now. Mary? You should be able to unmute now. You got to do it yourself. Yep. No, you're not doing it. How about Elizabeth Chan? Chan, is it? I can't see the full name. Chan. Yes, Elizabeth Chan. Elizabeth, you can unmute yourself now. Go ahead. Yep, you're unmute. You're Go ahead, Elizabeth. Proceed. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Talk. Speak. Can't hear you, Elizabeth. Did she mute herself or did you mute yeah. her? Yeah, no. She herself. muted herself. Okay, I'm trying one more time. Try to unmute now. Okay, I don't know. Elizabeth, and Mary, you're back and you're unmuted. Can you speak? I want to leave. Mary? Yes, can you hear me? Thank okay. you. I can hear you. Now. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, my question is, may we call allied when we see uh, particular issues on the Pataki walkway? I was told the last meeting that they allied would be patrolling. I've not seen a single allied uh, staff member since the last meeting. Um, but I certainly have seen problems. For one thing, you're discussing. Uh, Marijuana smoking, I guess I smell it almost every day that I'm there. Uh, I haven't called Allied. I didn't think that necessarily that rose to an issue. But what was a little more concerning, the uh, Sunday before Memorial Day, um, I saw a man urinating on the uh, Pataki walkway. He wasn't standing in the bushes. He was standing next to a bench. Obviously, if I had called Allied, they wouldn't have gotten there anywhere near when it was still going on. So what does one do in these situations? Is Allied going to be patrolling or not? Are they amenable to people calling when someone is you know, smoking on a bench for maybe 15 minutes, uh, a marijuana cigarette? Um, what do we do? Thank you. Patrick or Nick? Uh, well, since uh, they set up the uh... The benches and the tables and chairs over there, I put out two geotags, one down by first place, the other one down by second place. Uh, <clears throat> and Ally does patrol there. I can tell the number of times because every time they hit the geotag, it's date time stamped. Uh, you can give us a call if they're smoking marijuana there, we'll respond. Uh, Right now, uh, I think we had received a complaint and I did a search, you know, and like from uh, midnight to three o'clock, we, they hit the geotags 50 times. So we are patrolling there. You may not, <laughs> you may not see them at the time that you are there, but they're, you know, they sh they're hitting it roughly, you know, 45 minutes to maybe an hour each, each tag. So they are walking the area. 
I mean, it's not that somebody's assigned specific to that area. Thank you, Patrick. Yes. Um, um, go ahead. I would add, I'm sorry. I know that I recognize the name in the email. I have for some days now a draft response to you, but I remember this particular issue. Um, but yes, call allied as well. It, even if folks don't necessarily can't get there at the time, it doesn't hurt to have the. The, the complaint filed because what it helps us do is understand if there are particular areas or hotspots where things are happening that just helps inform us for for patrols as we go. I'll leave it to Pat to kind of, you know, deploy his resources as, as he best sees fit based on what he has, but it never hurts to have the, the data and the information and the data points. So by all means, yes, please call. And then we have uh, the ability and the um, the discretion to escalate as needed, but for instances like that, oftentimes it's just letting folks know to move along. Um, and I want to speak for Pat, but oftentimes I think they simply do move along and if they don't, then that's. That's something that we can address and escalate as appropriate. So, thank you. Anybody have anything else to say to Patrick? I see no hands. So, Nick, do you want to do your report? Oh, and then I should make an announcement too. I know that Elizabeth Chan is here. At least I think she's here and she wants to um, ask some questions about, um, I believe it's congestion pricing, but as new business. Yes. So, Elizabeth, we've called on you before, but you didn't unmute yourself. Um, and you're looking to do it for new business. And yes, with Tammy's permission, we're going to talk about that after Nick's report. But if you have anything to say about anything else, please raise your hand. You're welcome to speak on anything. Um, and let's move on, Nick, you're in charge. Okay. Um, when I hit send on my email to Lucian, I said, I can't believe this is. This is the last time I get to send you this and he sent me just a. A smile an upside down, a sad face in return, an up yeah. down, upside down smile. So, uh. We'll get to Lucian in a minute, but, uh, yeah, if you wouldn't mind, bring that up Lucian. Thank you. We'll run through this. Um. Since it is Lucian's kind of last time or last merry-go-round here, I wanted to make sure that we did this. We did this well for him. These are always, as you know, kind of a real labor of love for me. But especially since this was Lucian's last time, I wanted to make sure we made this. Uh, we made this as good as we can. So, Lucian, if you can start scrolling through, thanks, um, Nick. Yeah, the, the looking great. Thank, thank, <laughs> thank you. Um, Usually put kind of a top item here. This is just a, a, a beautiful uh, Ito peony. That's uh, perennial, and that's just a. I put a note there about where you can find it currently blooming in the gardens along the eastern border and the Esplanade and Rockefeller Park. So, um, just a really beautiful picture to lead things off. Um, as we know, it's been all the rage lately, but uh, I just put a kind of quick note there about the Canadian wildfires, as we know, which has been impacting air quality over the past couple of days. The, we always say in a figurative sense that the kind of world seems to be on fire. It literally now seems to be on fire. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, the governor put out uh, some information yesterday. And then what you can see at the top of page two there is I just I, I linked to it, but I also excerpted. Um, Kind of some just pointers about what you can do, and essentially it's uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you can stay indoors where the particular matter, if you're not indoors with someone else who necessarily smokes tobacco or does something else, you're, you're probably better off indoors, especially if you have some kind of pre-existing health conditions. Um, you can minimize outdoor and indoor sources of smoke, and you can avoid strenuous activities in areas. Um, where there's there's poor air quality, and then I linked a couple of additional resources there, both on the state environmental conservation and the Department of Health uh, website. Um, and then, of course, it's just a sad note, but kind of a sober one that these worsening wildfires and conditions that we're seeing all around are an unfortunate symptom of climate change and kind of a, a stark reminder of why the work that we're doing in partnership with with you all at the community board. Uh, and other partners across the city and state is as vital and urgent um, as it is. So with that, obviously we have the, the COVID-19 items number two, we just put the, the latest update there since the CDC and the federal government has now um, 
uh, declassified. I'm not, not, may not be using the right term, but since COVID is no longer a national health emergency, I put the final uh, notice there from the governor made dated May 12th, which is the final update to New Yorkers uh, state's progress on combating COVID-19. That's item number two there on the second page. Um, but all the resources are still available online for folks who need information about vaccines or uh, treatments. Um, so leading into that then is the kind of other than the wildfires and COVID, the top item I want to focus on tonight, obviously making sure people know about is our next Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project. That's community meeting uh, number five coming up on June 26th. Lucian, that's at the bottom there of page, uh, bottom of page two, which you will see. We have the notice there with the information. And then if you scroll down to the top of page uh, three there, Lucian, we have the, the information. But by and large, for the benefit of the committee, as many of you who have been following along know, um, we did a series of very successful reach specific workshops in February and March, which broke the project out into a com its component parts, which is one through seven. Um, we had a very successful round of those meetings. Um, and those were subsequent to a large meeting we had back last September to kind of provide an update on the project. What we are now doing in June is uh, bringing back all the feedback uh, and input we've gotten from those meetings as we uh, approach our 30% design milestone on the project. Uh, what we also wanted to do for the June 26th meeting in response to uh, some of the feedback and what we thought were good recommendations that we got was we're doing two identical sessions on that night. So it's June 26, 2023. It's two Mondays, three mon almost three Mondays from now. Um, but we are doing a session at 4.30 and at 6.30. It's the same session twice. But if you are someone who um, wants to kind of pick the kids up and go home and then have dinner and come out to a meeting, you can do that. If you instead just want to come right to the meeting from work and participate and then go home, you can do it that way. It will also not only be two sessions that are identical, it will also be um, live streamed both sessions. So if you want to participate remotely, you can do that uh, as well. One of the comments I just saw come in, yes. So it's, this is actually very good. I'm glad you asked. Um, when you click on the invite, you will see the full event right lists out the whole agenda. So the presentations are at 4.30 and 6.30, but the doors open at 4. So I wanted to put the early date on the flyer uh, because what you'll have when you walk into Stuyvesant is you'll have um, some of the physical boards set up in the lobby where you can see some of the, the physical assets that we've showed before about some of the project stretches and scopes. I know from a personal perspective, if I see a meeting starts at 4.30, I might not get to till 40.45 and I'll, I'll miss not only the first 15 minutes of the presentation, but also the beginning part where I was able to kind of be in the lobby and talk to some of the folks who were designing the project. So basically, the flyer says 4 p.m. because that's when the doors open. Those um, public assets in the lobby will be there throughout the whole night. And then the first presentation runs from 4.30 to 6. And then the second presentation, which is the same as the first, runs from 6.30 to 8. Um, but the, I have a question. The space will be open the whole time. Yes, go ahead, Justine. My question is: um, You said it's going to be live streamed, um, so if people can listen. Will they be able to interact and ask questions, or no? Yes, the idea is to run, have it run basically the way this meeting is running. And the, of the many things that Lucian has done, um, he's also provided over the course of these many years some great guidance. And we talked about it again the other day. We we kind of, uh, I wanted to understand on the back end how it works technically, but yes, that's the idea. We want to have it like this meeting is running. So we'll present it in person, but then we'll also have people who want to tune in, do it, um, and be able to submit questions and have them, um, have them presented out so everyone can hear the question and then uh, uh, have the question addressed and answer addressed there. Or if there's follow-up needed, we'll obviously put some answers out. But yes, that's the idea. It's not just kind of a live stream broadcast, it's meant to be live streamed and also people can participate like people are tonight. That's excellent. Okay, so that's yeah. great. So it'll be it'll be virtual and people can interact. That's lovely. And we want to try and make it as accessible, uh, as accessible as we can for, for as many people as we can. Yeah. And thank um, you for trying to accommodate um, 
the, you know, the earlier session and the later session for people. Yeah, who yeah, can't I, make thought, the later you know, one. I thought it was a good. It was a, it was a good suggestion. Um, and, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but I know that uh, this is something we had discussed also. And as, as we had discussed previously, we and I had a chance to sit down with some staff here as well in the uh, in between since when we last got together and tonight to also map out some of the contours for outreach. So this is a kind of a uh, not complete list, but just so we have a sense of some of the outreach. You will have already seen it likely in the pages of some of our fine local publications, including the broadsheet. I know Matt had called in. I'm not trying to uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to butter him up, but you know, it's in the pages of the broadsheet. Um, Tribeca Trib, you've seen it in uh, Tribeca Phi Dye Patch, the Downtown Post NYC. I believe the Tribeca Citizen will have it featured in, in some of its upcoming newsletters. They do those, I think, Mondays, Thursdays. Uh, we're talking about it tonight. Um, BJ Jones, our president and CEO, had it as part of his resiliency update yesterday at the BPC uh, a board meeting. Justine, I know I saw you there. It's multiple places on our website and on social media. Newsletter wise, Nick, again, yes. Wait, oh, sorry. Can I ask that you also put it on your signs, those sign posts? Oh, I'm only halfway through my list, Justine. You just got wait. it. Thank you. Go ahead. Of the many things I learned from Lucian, and again, he's going to get uh, a more proper send off in, in a few minutes, but uh, Lucian very helpfully put it in the community, the Manhattan Community Board One newsletter that went out on Monday. It was a top item, Lucian, so thank you for that. Uh, we sent out a MailChimp just this afternoon, which goes to about 14,000 or so folks. Um, and we're going to continue doing that, I think, in each of the weeks, each of the three weeks leading up to the meeting to ensure maximum kind of saturation. So it was this Wednesday, the 7th. We're going to try and do one next Wednesday, the following Thursday, and then maybe even the morning of the meeting. As Jeff Galloway and I kind of uh, laughed slash lamented about last time, the goal here is to have someone literally have to be living under a rock not to have heard about this meeting and or make a conscious decision that I don't want to be part of it, but we don't want to have people not know that the meeting is happening. So dedicated MailChimp blasts and then um, yes, posters in the parks kiosks. You should see those hopefully by the end of the week um, and hopefully some direct mailings as well. Some, some postcards directly mailed to people that they physically in the old Gale Brewer mold you literally have to have held the thing in your hand and decided not to pay attention to it. Um, there's a chance you don't read your email or you're not online. You don't read the papers, but if you physically get a piece of mail, you can't honestly say you didn't hold it in your hand um, and have the opportunity to know that the meeting was happening. So we're and going to be sure, interesting. We are going one to more thing. Make sure you go. You're going to get outside of Battery Park City if you're going to do that. Which I think the kiosks are going to do. But like for is it IPN or whatever the whatever the, the yeah, places are that yep, yep, last yep. time they aware. But also, yeah, the the zip code we had identified. We talked about one zero zero one three, which is that zip code directly, uh, right along where the northern portion of the the project would run. To run it, look to try and do a direct mailing there, and perhaps some link NYC kiosks as well. Um, Lucian had sent me also some very helpful information about how to get ads placed there. So, so more to come, but we are looking to, um, we're looking to flood the zone as the. As the saying goes and pardon the pun. All right, um, okay, next item there Lucian is, uh. Not just the public meeting for the Northwest, but a couple of community notices have been put out as well. So there are traffic count cameras um, along the project site over the course of the month. This is to aid in data collection for the environmental impact statement for the Northwest. Um, part of when you do the DAS, you have to capture adequate both vehicular and pedestrian traffic counts. So that's what that's doing just to kind of get a sense of what the general usage is of the parks and the roadbeds throughout the project site. Um, and the reason it's being done now is because this is when the parks and the streets really are at their peak. You have the weather is beautiful. Um, a lot of people are out and about and also school is still in session. So we wanted to make sure that we captured that um, before school lets out for the summer and people are either leaving town or not in the neighborhood as frequently as they might otherwise be. So those are up now. There's a blog post about it that I've linked to on our site. Um, but those will be uh, that work will be complete and the cameras removed. Um, by the end of the month, likely earlier, but by the time June is out, that, that work will be done. 
And there's also below that some geotechnical sampling work, which I touched on a little bit last month, but just uh, I put it up there again in case people are wondering. That's kind of subsoil analyses and borings that are being done. But there's some more information about that on our site as well. And then the last item on the northwest for now is um, Jeff, I know you're here, and, and Rosalie as well. We had the opportunity to have a very nice briefing with the Gateway Plaza Tenants Association some weeks ago. So thanks for the hospitality. Um, I've hyperlinked that presentation and the video from that from that meeting uh, as well. So thank you, GPTA, uh, and more to come. More to come there. Yeah, and thank you, Nick. I, I think it was a it was a very uh, helpful program and very well attended. <clears throat> yes, I thought so. Thank you for that. Thanks for helping coordinate you and Rosalie both. Uh, on the south, um, we talked about it last month uh, a little bit as well. But as we know, uh, construction's underway. What we have done also is uh, starting doing kind of our biweekly, two week, or I said biweekly uh, construction notifications, basically two week look aheads um, that we push out and then push on the side as well. So it's basically like, hey, for the next two weeks, what will you expect to uh, have been going on in the site? That's just kind of general best practice um, that we pushed out. And obviously, solutions also helpful there and kind of giving some thoughts about how that might take its, its form and shape. So that's out as well, and that's on the south. Okay, going down now to page four, a couple of just quick items here. Um, Nick, if I could just pop in really quick. Um, go ahead. The, the South Battery Park City C, uh, CCL is invited to the Quality of Life Committee meeting this month. Oh, this right, yes, the, yes. This is the, the every other month we had all the, the big projects, CCLs and engineers come in to give updates. Um, so that's happening this month. So just putting that on your radar for Rick. Uh, Great. I've been, I've been, he's been very responsive for me, and I know that other things have been raised. He's been able to uh, uh, engage on it. So thank you for for that. I've been very happy working with Rick. Um, yes, I work a lot of CCLs, and he's right up there. Yes, thank you, thank you for that. Rick is Rick is Rick, Rick is top notch, and his information is there. You say Rick Fogarty is a CCL for the project. There's an email address. And a cell phone that he can be reached at with project issues uh, and matters as they arise. Thank you for, for raising that. Okay, um, a little bit more of a, a somber note now, but uh, we had mentioned him before. Um, as we know, Bob Schneck passed last month, and there's just a statement there from from uh, from BJ. I just want to read it into the record, if I might take a moment um, about Bob. Bob loved this community and cared deeply about its future, especially when it came to addressing our most pressing issues like sustainability, resiliency, livability. Whether it was at public meetings or crossing paths around the neighborhood, he was always an eager, he was always eager to offer insights, advice, and recommendations, and did so frankly and with a smile. And he was generous in his creativity as well, through photography and written word that captured the spirit of the neighborhood he called home. Our thoughts are and remain with his partner Cora and his family and many friends, including um, many of you on the community board. And I had some nice, long and good conversations with Bob throughout the years as well. And it um, was a real gut punch, obviously, as these things always are. So we'll miss you, Bob, and um, your contributions are uh, will never be forgotten. Um, the next note here, and I'm going to embarrass him perhaps, but only a little bit, um, just a few words about uh, Lucian Reynolds. Um, over the course of my career, I've had the, the privilege of working with really some incredible public servants, and Lucian's right at the top. He had some nice things to say just now about Rick, but uh, Lucian is uh, top notch. He's, he's tough but fair, and he's consistently help me do my job better and more thoroughly and, and thoughtfully. So thank you, Lucian, for that. You know, we've had on more than one occasion caught an Uptown 6 train um, together after a late community board meeting or two. And we talked about, we had the chance to talk about, among other things, the politics and personalities in the city we love so much. So uh, thank you for that. Our loss at the community district level is the larger city's gain. So while I'm very happy for Lucian, um, we're going to miss him. His professionalism and his partnership and his policy chops, really, it's just a whole package. So Lucian, know that you left this place better than you found it. And for a true public servant like you are, I know there's no there's no higher compliment than that. So thank you. Thank you, Nick. 
and good luck to you. you. And I'm just working with all of you as well. Um, seriously, I, I, I thank you. Um, so coming up in Battery Park City again, we are talk about heating up. We are we have a really have more events than you can shake a stick at coming up in June. I'm not going to belabor the point, go through every one, but just I always make it a point to try and put some some great pictures and images here, link from our calendar. We have uh, the Paul Taylor School coming up uh, tomorrow night at Belvedere Plaza. It's a dance ensemble. It really should be a wonderful, wonderful show for all those who are there and who want to attend. We have Community Dance Mambo there, Lucian, at the top of page five. Um, that's on Saturday, um, June 10th at Esplanade Plaza. And then, obviously, as we know, the River to River Festival is about to kick off, and we have two events there, um, June 10th and 11th, which is this weekend is uh, the river that flows two ways, which is a large scale tape installation interactive for kids uh, and parents and anyone else who would like to participate. That's also at Belvedere Plaza. And then we're especially honored to be able to host the closing concert for River to River. And that's next Saturday, the 17th at Rockefeller Plaza. That's Natsu Kamara. Um, uh, She's a Guinean musician and activist, and she will be doing the closing concert for River to River, which is really a special, special thing to be a part of. Uh, and River to River generally is just a wonderful celebration of all downtown has to offer. Um, I encourage everyone to participate to the extent that they can. Um, the bottom of that page, we mentioned this briefly last month, but um, again, Marianne, uh, this one's for you. I know you may be out of town, but also <laughs> we're going to be blasting it out. And if there's anyone particular we want to focus, I can uh, literally ping them on it as well. But we have a, an information session about Omni, which is the new contactless fare payment system for the MTA that's coming up. That's next Wednesday, the 14th at Six River Terrace. We'll have a representative from the MTA come and uh, just give a kind of a briefing to anybody who might be interested, not just for seniors, anybody who might be interested in how that, that process works. Um, not super complicated, but for folks who are uninitiated, maybe a little bit, um, but it's something new. So we wanted to make sure that we had had that uh, available for folks. And Marianne, thank you for the recommendation. Uh, we were glad to be able to get that set up uh, with MTA. Okay, moving on. Uh, we have a range of events coming up then for Pride Month as well. We have the Silent Disco Pride Party on the 15th. Um, and on the 17th, we have our annual Juneteenth celebration at Rockefeller Park. We've been doing this for a number of years now. Um, it's always a fun event with the Federation of Black Cowboys, but also we are um, infusing that with uh, some additional African history uh, from West Africa. There'll be some. Uh, some print fabrics and other activities for folks to take part in. That's Saturday, June 17th. Should be a really wonderful event. The Midsummer Festival, another staple of our summer calendar, is again obviously back in Battery Park City this year. It is in Rockefeller Park, as a lot of the big events will be now with the closure of Wagner. That's Friday, June 23rd, and that is, as you know, right around uh, the summer solstice, longest day of the year. So that's the Swedish Festival on the 23rd. And then community field day, which is always timed at or around the closure of school. That's Wednesday, the 28th. That's at Rockefeller Park and there's music, games, dancing, ice cream. Coaches from the New York Liberty will be there for kids. Um, and really, it's 1 of the biggest parties of the year. So we invite everyone to. To take part and coming up more to come in July, but river and blues, which is our much celebrated and heralded. Free outdoor summer concert series. Thursdays in July, very easy to remember. So July 6th, July 13th, July 20th, and July 27th, also in Rockefeller Park. So new location, same great uh, summer sounds, uh, River and Blues, Thursdays in July. Okay, sorry, Justine, I wanted to make sure that I was very thorough for Lucian's last, last go around here. Um, I put a community reminder there about, it's up on our website as well, Financial assistance for Medicare beneficiaries. There's a lot of info. I won't go through it now, but if you are a Medicare recipient, you uh, have the ability to apply for up to, in some cases, $7,300 uh, in annual financial assistance. And all that information is there from our partners at the New York State Office for the Aging. Um, and then scrolling down to the bottom of the page, uh, you've seen this as well, I think, but for the benefit of the folks, this is slightly outside Battery Park City, but certainly impactful. 
reminder that the Battery Park underpass is going to be closed overnight uh, through June 30th on weeknights, uh, week, weekdays, weekday nights through June 30th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. The Battery Park underpass will be closed one lane at a time while they do uh, maintenance work. And then I was at the bottom of the page. I made it a point to put a picture in there as well as a reminder to all our neighbors. We love our four legged friends, um, but they are not allowed on lawns and turf areas throughout Battery Park City, um, both for the enjoyment of the folks who like to lay on the lawns and enjoy them, and also for our great horticulturalists who do so much fine work in keeping Battery Park City as beautiful as it is. Okay, parks happenings. I will go through not each one of these. Um, but just as a note, some highlights here. So, um, if you see some work going on around River Terrace this summer for the removal of trees, that is just, again, part of the circle of life. There are dead or dying trees that, that just sometimes trees get old and they die or they're, they're kind of through their life. Um, they will be removed and they will be replaced during the fall planting season, which is usually around the October timeline. We report on this each year when we get new shipment of trees in. But if you see that, that's what's going on. We have a tree canopy and biodiversity inventory going on, which is hyperlinked there. Um, that's to further inform our horticultural practices and increase greenery over the course of the decade in keeping with our sustainability plan. We have our uh, planting of the Route 9A median. You'll see native plant plugs there to, uh, being planted over the course of the month. And you'll see a beautiful shot there of some of the new pride benches uh, that have been just painted there um, along uh, the Esplanade by Rockefeller Park. That's a little further north than the benches we had discussed previously. But we are uh, always happy and very proud to celebrate, uh, celebrate pride. And then the last thing I would note is that, that picture on the bottom right of the page, um, that's the beautiful planting at the ball field terrace. Um, so you'll see some beautiful new plantings and trees there, and that's right um, as uh, the ball field terrace as you look down and watch and watch the games. So just a couple of highlights of what's going on in our parks, and I will blow. I will run through the rest of this fairly quickly, but just some highlights from what we were able to. Uh, uh, some of the program we put on our park since we last all got together. So drag story hour on Saturday um, was a real hit. We thank everyone uh, who attended. We had a really fabulous time and my family, my own family come down as well. And we just had a really wonderful Saturday morning in the park. Strings on Hudson was on the 25th and that's our outdoor classical music series. Um, we had a master of light screening, which is a very um, poignant documentary that HBO has produced. Uh, it tells the story of George Anthony uh, Morton, who was a classical painter, spent many years in prison, um, and that was on a kind of journey to break the cycle of intergenerational trauma and incarceration. That was a very nice event, and you can read more about uh, the Master of Light documentary as it's hyperlinked there. Go Fish, the top of the next page, Lucian was moved indoors. That should say May 20th, my apologies, I'll fix that. Um, that was moved indoors for intermittent weather, but that was a wonderful presentation as well. Honoring motherhood on Mother's Day, we had a very uh, nice presentation with um, special guest James Yaya Hop in front of his installation, um, Just It Reflected, which is on Esplanade Plaza, as you all know. And um, uh, this is going a little bit way back, but at the end of April, we were able to dedicate um, the newly expanded police memorial there to those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. You'll see some pictures there at the bottom of, uh, of page 10. Um, Tammy Meltzer was able to join us for the ceremony as well on the, what is a very solemn but very important day. Um, and that was in late April. So a couple more things here I'll just add until we, we get to the end. Uh, top of page 11. I mentioned this, I think, to Justine, perhaps Jeff as well. Um, but if you have been down uh, the path by the Pataki walkway, which we talked about a little earlier, we have some tables and chairs out there now in advance of the, um, the play space that's going to be installed in the, in the coming weeks. Just kind of a little teaser. So you'll see some tables and chairs there. Uh, and so far, it's been uh, fairly well received. We see some people um, sitting out there and eating and enjoying Battery Park City from a little bit of a new perspective. So that's just a shot of it there. There's some more information linked um, in that bullet. 
Hey. Let me just say this, Nick. This is the park, right? This is the park. No smoking allowed here. And the ambassadors are going by. Yep. Every forty-five minutes to an hour, and they're checking on it. They were. They were. They, they were. They are making that part of their normal patrols. Perfect. Thank you. Just making a note of it in in yep. reference to the picture of it. Thank you. Uh, and then we have the police community council. That's that's usually the last Thursday of every month, but uh, I was able to confirm with Nick today very helpfully. This month they're doing it June 22nd, not June 29th. And that's because um, they don't want to get too close to the holiday weekend. So Thursday, June 22nd is the first precinct um, community council. You will see that there, uh, Lucian, right below the chart of the, the board meeting dates. Okay. Right there, yeah, June 22nd. And then the last thing I would just note for the for the group here is our upcoming uh, permits. That's at the top of page 12. Lucian, 12 pages for your for your farewell. I wanted to make sure that you knew that. Um, not a lot of external events in June. We had a we had a number of them in May. What I do want to bring the folks' attention to is um, a couple of sidewalk sheds are going up, and this is because, as you may know, or many of us know, local law 11 requires uh, buildings to have periodic uh, inspections of their uh, exterior facades. So you'll see some uh, sidewalk sheds going up in those areas. One is 200, 300 North End Avenue. Um, that facade will go up, uh, the sidewalk shed will go up. It will not limit access to the ball field terrace, but there will be a sidewalk shed there as that work is being done on the building. Um, and then in the south of the neighborhood, 200 and 380 Rector Place, Permits are pending there, but there was also that similar type of work being done, um, and that will be starting up soon. As far as I have it, it will not impact or uh, limit access to the sidewalk that's adjacent and alongside West Thames Park, but there will be a sidewalk shed there. If anything changes, I will let you know. But when you see those things going up along the neighborhood, that's just regular course of city business. Buildings need to have their facades inspected periodically, and when they do that inspection, they have to have a sidewalk shed installed um, to ensure safety for pedestrians and passers-by. So, Nick, I'm going, stick, I'm going to stick my two cents into you for a second on the sidewalk sheds. Go ahead. So, um, the north end I'm not as familiar with, but I can tell you on the south, um, along Albany Street, there's been, and, and a lot of the building uh, resident, you know, condo owners, as well as the board members have been complaining about the extent that is it DOB, the Department of Buildings, that are requiring the sidewalk sheds to be out and covering so much more um, land. And there was like pushback, I believe, that some of the folks by the Esplanade, uh, so 380 Rector and then 377, I believe. The first iteration of it was they had to bring it and go all the way across the Esplanade to the wall, and then that got pushed back. Is there anything that the and this was this is all new? This wasn't yeah. the case in years past, and it's really expensive. Um, I know that uh, the same is being faced with 200 Rector because I live here, and they're making us go so much farther than we've had to go in the in the past. And I wonder if if you've been in touch with the management companies of the different buildings or they've tried to get the BPCA's help in pushing back on the DOB because of course the whole purpose of the sheds is to protect people from any kind of debris falling right. or equipment so, so there's a reason for them not complaining about that not complaining that the inspections have to get done but if there's no reason to be so far out what can the if anything can the BPCA help lobby the buildings to push back as to can we keep it the way it used to be versus extend it and I see Lucian's hand is raised, right. and I see that Emily Prop as a, as a. But if you have an answer, Nick, great. And then Lucian. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I can, I can ask. Um, I don't. I usually, I, you know, DOB certainly has the, its parameters and requirements in place. But, um, yes, I mean, if there's a, a, a question or something that I can actually, I'm happy to have a conversation. But go ahead, Lucian. Yeah. There are there are two in my experience with the sidewalk shed issue. There are two distinct um, routes that that the community board can take to lobby to to push for uh, saner regulations on this. And I, I I don't usually describe a policy as insane as being insane unless it's this one. Um, that almost no other city in the world has a level of sidewalk shed 
construction and, 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 and scaffolding as the city of New York. And there's nothing particularly special about New York City um, that would require such a, a series of, of, of pedestrian protections outside of what other world cities are doing. And, and even cities have comparable architecture typologies like Chicago. Hold on one second. Oh, my son just decided to harmonica. Um, like Chicago don't even have this level of, 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 of and, and there's, there's a good reason for that. One is, and they're often overlooked, but the state has mandated uh, 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 very high liability uh, for facade elements. Um, and that's number one and beyond, I think, what any other state has, has, has established. So there's a state, there's a, there's a, a, a part to play for our state elected officials. Um, and so they are absolutely uh, a part of the solution. And the other is local law 11 or FISP, as it's now referred to, reform. Uh, and, and there's been a couple of things that the city council is every time there's some sort of kind of tragedy, you know, th there's additional requirements. So buildings over 14 stories have to have a site safety supervisor that's like on, you know, on call all the time that adds up enormous amounts of cost. Um, those sorts of things can be unwound. Um, certainly there are more modern things that can be done to eliminate or reduce the need for sidewalk sheds like the use of, of drones for inspections and the like. Um, facade repair, of course, is a different story. Once you have the inspection, identify loose facade elements, but that's not to say that there's you know, a, a big world of options out there that have not been explored legislatively and, and this is absolutely right for reform. So Justine, you're 100% uh, uh, in the right to say there there's, has to be a better way to do all this that doesn't contribute to insane uh, costs or that are always passed on to the inhabitants of the building, whether they're renters or, or, or owners, condo owners. So, you know, I, I definitely encourage everyone to, to, you know, support those who are, are looking for reform, but also to not ignore the role of the state uh, in this, uh, uh, this large saga. Remember, there's only a couple of firms that do sidewalk sheds. It's, it's almost a oligopoly and they do rent seeking and they want to protect this uh, incredible cash machine that is setting up uh, a couple pieces of wood and pipe and then just getting rent for it for you know years on end without having to do anything else special uh, if you think about it. So anyway, I'll leave you all with that. Thank you. Thanks, Lucia. And I'm going to follow up with you. Um, <laughs> so you're not rid of me yet. <laughs> all right, sorry. Um, Emily. Can we un unmute Emily and see if she's got a comment about anything that Nick just said? Emily, you can go ahead. Go ahead, Emily. You're unmuted. Okay. Uh, just a quick question. I think I just missed this earlier in the meeting. The resiliency meeting on um, June 26th, is that hybrid or strictly in person? Um, hi, Emily. It's uh, hybrid. Okay, great. Thank yep. you. Okay, thanks. Emma. That's it. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. So, um, I think we're done with everything we were going to talk about here, but we do have some new business. So, Emily. Chan, I would give the floor. Oh, oh, I see. Wait, Lucian, you're, are you waving? Yes, oh, my hand should go Eric. down. Elizabeth has been unmuted. And, and Eric, are you, um. Hand raised or no? Uh, I can't hear. You're muted, Eric. Sorry, I just had a quick question. Some people have talked to me about um, spraying for mosquitoes. Is that going to happen oh. anytime soon? Spraying for mosquitoes. I don't know. Is that a that's a city thing or is that Nick? Is that a Barry Park City Authority thing? You know, I don't remember you ever yeah, talking about. I mean, it. if it's a city park, it's city. If it's Barry Park City Park. It would be us. I don't know. I don't know, Eric. Let, let, let me follow up for you. Um, we are obviously we're chemical free, as you guys all know in Battery Park City. That doesn't mean there are other ways to do it. But let me find out about mosquitoes for you. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All uh, right. Uh, Emily. One one oh. PSA. Um, if you do identify any areas of standing water that you in your travels, everyone here that's. Everyone at this meeting, if you identify any standing pools of water, do let the authority know. 
um, because if those can be drained, then you'll eliminate a, a breeding ground for mosquitoes. They require standing water. So yep. see a tire anywhere or any other kind of thing that's collecting rainwater and the rainwater is not going away, let someone know so they can get rid of it. Perfect. Thank you. That's a good point, Lucian. And Elizabeth, but she muted herself by accident when I said Eric could go. You're good to go. So, go ahead. Go ahead on, there you go. Hey, can, go ahead, you guys, can you guys hear me this time? Yes. Indeed. Hi, so I just wanted to thank you, Justine, for um, letting me uh, present new business for this committee. Um, I just want to briefly go back to um, the point that Matthew Fenton made about how people died in this neighborhood because their government lied to them. I want to say that my family was one of the surviving families on 9-11, and my family was so disappointed by Christine Todd Whitman from the EPA, who spent a lot of time assuring families to stay in Battery Park City, mostly for revenue and business reasons, and that trust in government is now ending up breaking hearts of families all over this neighborhood. No one that lives in this neighborhood has not been touched by 9-11 in some way, but I think it was very relevant. I don't think it, there are coincidences. But going back to putting the EPA on task, this is the number one reason why I'm here at this meeting. And I'm so happy that Nick is on the call because I do think it's important for a Battery Park City Authority member to hear what now 160, over 160 Battery Park City residents want to say about congestion pricing and the proposal that was just um, moved for public comment by the EPA. So we're in a NEPA process. I don't know if you're familiar with that, Nick. Um, it's a federal process for the Federal Highway um, Commission and the DOT and the MTA to present for public comment um, if it should infringe on governmental, I mean, uh, on environmental injustices or economic injustices. And so um, I actually have a statement that I would like to read on behalf of these 160 Battery Park City residents. I'm actually going to put a link to the statement um, in the chat. I would like it to be on the record. <clears throat> on May 5th, 2023, the US Department of Transportation published a final environmental assessment, EA, for the Central Business District Tolling Program, the CBDTP, and which required the start of the National Environmental Policy Act and EPA's 45-day public review process as a condition to apply the FHWA Value Price Pilot Program, the VPPP. I represent a coalition of neighbors in Battery Park City that have reviewed this public document and are concerned about its evaluation of finding of no significant impact, FONSI. A coalition of residents of Battery Park City against congestion tolls do not agree that this proposal has taken the proper environmental assessment or has taken into consideration our community's economic needs, have not done and will require further due diligence as the VPPP plan causes environmental and economic injustices that impact our neighborhood. As of this moment, 160 Battery Park City residents who were verified by their addresses responded to a Google Docs survey conducted over the past five days now. 98.1% of the respondents want an exemption from the congestion pricing for Battery Park City residents. 83% of the respondents agree that the proposed congestion pricing would create financial hardship for their families. Many remarked on their concern that this would drive out residents and businesses in our neighborhood. Battery Park City is home to many families. Children under the age of 18 make up 25% of the Battery Park City population. We got that from the Demographic Statistical Atlas of the United States, which is based on census records, but I think it's more now. Um, nearly half of the respondents may self-identify as persons of color. Let me ask, if ultimately the congestion pricing is approved, this coalition of Battery Park City residents are asking for an exemption from the congestion pricing. In the meantime, we further ask that the Federal Highway Administration, Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, New York State Department of Transportation, and the New York City Department of Transportation further reevaluate and conduct further due diligence to study the environmental and economic impact, the increase of vehicular traffic on the Battery Park community as it is geographically bound by the proposed exempted thoroughfares and uniquely affected in a way that no other neighborhood 
no other neighborhood is in the proposed central business district. The increase in traffic poses serious public safety and health concerns, particularly for the children, families, 9-11 survivors who are battling 9-11 related diseases and senior citizens that call BPC home. I, I didn't add this in the statement, but I did review it again. And they did say that a lot of the traffic would increase and the speeds of the vehicles are a, many of the highways and thoroughfares will be over 25 miles per hour. So the reasons for the ask. The proposed congestion pricing will burden those communities adjacent to the exempted thoroughfares. The increased congestion along these exempted thoroughfares will result in poor air quality for residents, as well as increased pedestrian injury and death. By crossing exempted thoroughfares to enter and exit, Battery Park City confines. They do mention asthmatic rates in the Bronx around some of the thoroughfares. I think um, a, a few of us are working on our comments and, and we did remark about that, but we, it's also remarkable that a study was not made about the increase of traffic down here in Battery Park City. Battery Park City has limited access points to enter and exit the neighborhood. It requires all residents to cross by foot or vehicle the West Side Highway. Further, there's no subway access in Battery Park City and limited bus options. Congestion pricing will impact local businesses in the congestion zone due to a loss of customer traffic. This will create financial hardship for local businesses. Battery Park City's Battery Park City residents already face high living costs and contribute additional income to New York in the form of the pilot payment in lieu of taxes program. This is in addition to the New York City personal income and property taxes. Additional costs make it harder for low to middle income families, several who are minority identifying. Historically, the BPC pilot revenue has often closed MTA budget gaps. Charging additional tolls would put further financial burden on a neighborhood that doesn't even have a single subway within the 92 acres that comprise the neighborhood. Consideration of minority groups who live in this area who are concerned about safety on public transport in our area was, was raised. Consideration of financial hardship as is stipulated and self-identified by residents currently residing in Battery Park City, which would lead to residential displacement. Many people said that they would be forced to move. Battery Park City has a high population of families with school children. Some of these residents rely on private transportation to and from school. There are various reasons that parents may need to transport children in this manner including lack of proximity to public transportation and disabilities that may prevent a child from taking public transportation. The MTA has compared its proposal to similar congestion pricing initiatives in London, Stockholm, and Singapore. These initiatives are not equitable in the least and do not impact residents in the same way. For example, the London system has 90% discount for those residing in the congestion zone. The Stockholm pricing is dependent on the time of day and is significantly less, co less costly it's US two to US four dollars a day. Um, so this is signed on behalf of Battery Park City residents against congestion bullying. Um, so I just I just wanted to say that on behalf of the now 160 residents and their families in the neighborhood. Elizabeth, first of all, thank you for all the research you've done to get to that point and get to this point. Um, I appreciate it. I agree with you like wholeheartedly. Um, yeah, you, I mean, every point you raise is is important. Um, it's important in Battery Park City. It's important in all of Lower Manhattan and all of the congestion zone. Um, it seems I really like um, what Eric Jesse said yesterday about the congestion pricing. Um, perhaps if there's need for money to be raised for the MTA, that the money get pushed off or the cost get pushed off to the actual users of the subway and the MTA and the and Long Island Railroad and not foisted on the um, residents of a zone, because this is not about congestion. This is about raising money. And if we could just identify that now, um, the downside of that is how do you identify the two truly poor people um, who can't afford an increase where 275 is a lot for them. Um, but I think that that should, that should be the discussion. However, that ship has kind of passed. Um, so I see that. But, but we're, we're, in a, we're in a juncture right now. We're in we're in the NEPA process where in their report they didn't even examine the environmental effects of 
an increase in traffic in in our area, which is home to many of the identified exempted thoroughfares, the West Side Highway, the under the Battery Park City underpass, the Hugh L, the Hugh Perry Tunnel, um, you know, the FDR, like all of these things end up in Battery Park City. Right? So, yes. I, think I and, and, and in reading and rereading and looking at the documents again, it is a white space in the understanding of the effects. And especially since the community is so physically bound by these thoroughfares that I, I implore everyone yeah. to help us, you know, even money aside, money aside, the environmental effects are dam could be damaging. I mean, we live through 9 11, right? So I'm, I'm just saying that what we are asking for is some kind of, well, to be heard and to, to further examine if this is really going to be beneficial for our neighborhood in an environmental perspective, because that's, that's the part of the process we're in right now. The EPA. So, what, so let me ask you a question. This is, they're doing the environmental impact statement right now. They're doing, they said they found no significant impact and they made a statement imploring to the federal highway commission to let them start this tolling process because they have done the quote unquote diligence, but okay. they left out our area and there are a lot of other, you know, they're just kind of sliding this proposal by without really. Wait, wait, wait. So I have, I'm asking reasons not to challenge you, but to get in, I'm, I, I have technical questions. So, um. I hear what you're saying that they did not do the environment. They, they did not consider our area they didn't. in the environmental impact statement. Has there been a decision? And is that what this public comment period is in the federal level? And Betty saying no, because I think there has been, I think that they said, yeah, we looked at it. Tough luck. There's no impact. No, and so no, no this, we're in so a federal, me. we're in a federal process right now. We're by June 12th. Uh, impacted populations are supposed to raise their hands and say, no, I'm a population that's affected by this. Um, please examine this and here's our solution. So what we want to do is we want to redline and comment the document, send it to the federal government, say that we would like further studies. You know, Nick, you, you, you mentioned the DEIS. I don't know if that's relevant data for this either. Um, or if it's like not, I don't it's know. The DEIS he's talking about is about the resiliency studies, so it's not about congestion pricing. No, but so, it's studying it's studying traffic patterns and and pedestrians, right? Uh, go ahead, Nick. Not not what you're talking about, I don't think, but I'm not going to speak for Nick. Yes, it's for the Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project to inform the DEIS. Um, but either way, it's not none of that. Data is going to be ready to be uh, complete or analyzed by June twelfth. So it doesn't. I don't think it's applicable here. Well, we'd, yeah, we'd, to, we to be clear, this is the final. The FONSI is the final part of the, the final environmental assessment, and so it, the draft finding is for the, the finding of no significant impact. But there's no EIS here. The EIS would happen if there was a significant impact. So. So, from an environmental review standpoint, they've cleared the threshold in the eyes of the Federal Highway Administration to not require the next, you know, the, the alternative, which is a full on environmental impact statement. Unless there are other populations that are flagging an environmental injustice or an economic injustice. My, my, my take on this, and this has been, I've also heard from. Uh, the MTA that it's beyond that an MTA is, issue. Well, the MTA being the authority that will be managing the transportation review mobility review board, which is they are the ones who are essentially running the program. Um, if it's you know it, now that it's approved, but hasn't gone oh. through the forty-five day public review period. No, no, no. Is, I, you know, well, I, if you would let, let me finish. Please let me finish. Wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's please listen let me finish. And then... Let, yeah, let's hear what he says. Thank you. Um, my understanding is that um, since the, the, the finding of no significant impact has taken into account the comments were made during the actual open comment period, and the federal government has reviewed this for more than a year, this has taken into account those comments that were made, and including those that were made by 
the the federal representatives. And this is simply a time where people can look to see what changes have been made before it goes into effect. I have scoured every typical corner where agencies that are soliciting public feedback have created portals to collect such feedback, including the, the websites of the Federal Highway Administration and the district that represents the city of New York, and none such exist. The Chris Marte's office has reached out to the MTA, and they've said that this is not meant to solicit public feedback. However, you can still send things to the MTA, but I do well, not believe this level. is wired to change the results of no. the FONSI. It's That's not in, at an MTA level, and I am so frustrated by this community board because I keep and I've spoken with Marte, and he understands what I'm saying, and I've spoken to Assembly Fall, Assemblyman Fall, and they understand what I'm saying. Um, this is not at the MTA level. The MTA has a vested interest to make sure we don't change their plan. Yeah. So I'm just saying that right I now. I've not said the MTA soliciting I, I, input. I, was, I am. I listen to you, Lucian, and I respect you highly. But I'm. I want to finish. I put in a link to the citizens' guide to the NEPA, having your voice heard. This is the pro part of the process where we're at. Page 27 is how to make comments on a Fonzie document. This happens with a lot of. Um, infrastructural changes that happen that affect populations. This is part of the process. This is how we make our comments. The MTA had a public hearing for public comments. They shoved it in an addendum in this document saying, yeah, we heard it. This is what they said, but that didn't mean that they took it into consideration. They're just CYA right now. It's in the document. Now we are in a federal process where Populations who have not been heard, including Battery Park City, because there's no mention of it, right? Have to raise our hands and say, we want a reevaluation of the impact or the statement that there is no significant impact. We actually disagree. And so when I have been begging the community board to, to, to do an emergency meeting on this, when I've been at, when yesterday I presented this in the transportation committee and you guys wanted to help with a resolution and I was shot down. When I said, you know, I read the bylaws and there, there's an ability for us to have an emergency meeting and I was still shot down because I was told some cockamamie thing about the MTA. I am giving you the receipts. We are not at an MTA level. We are at a federal EPA review level. Read it on page 27. That is how we comment. That is how we, we, we kick back our comments and let and raise our hands so that when the EPA tells us that it's safe and we're all dying from cancers related to vehicular exhaust, we're not saying, oh, but they told us we were safe. Because these things happen in time. Asthma happens in time, cancers happen in time, and I want to stop time right now and make sure that someone is accountable to this neighborhood who has already been devastated by the EPA. Shin, what can we do? I know this is not the committee, to be doing it. I know this is transportation committee. It's not our program. I was shot down. I know, I know, I know. Now and I'm Chris Marte what? tried, and so did Assemblyman uh, Fall's office, and, and we were all shot down. So I have to figure out a way to, to placate the federal process despite my community board turning this away. Question for you, Lucian. Is there something that can be done? Because we do have, I mean, the resolutions we have do not, I believe, I've got to read it again carefully. It talks about exemptions for the people that live in the, in the congestion zone. It talks about a lot of things, but it does not mention impact, or does it? We asked for an environmental impact study, but it was done in 2021. So. And they see, and they, and they said, yeah, we heard you here. We yeah. proof that we heard you. They collect the comments and they don't even respond to it. They just yeah. said, oh yeah, comments were made. But whether or not they did anything about it, they didn't mention it. So we are in a second process where the EPA is literally asking us as a commu as community members who are supposed to read this. Do you know how we're supposed to read this? We're supposed to go to the office and read a 1000 page document all over the state. That's what we're supposed to do. And I'm supposed to mail back a 1000 page document back to these organizations because they make it so laborious and tough to change. And we've done the legwork, this cohort of residents, we are doing the legwork. 
So we shouldn't have our own community board st standing in our way. I'm sorry. Because the information you're giving me about the MTA is irrelevant. This is a federal commenting period. I made it clear that this is the Federal Highway Administration. I think that in the absence of finding a way to comment, it's a pretty clear indicator that this is not something that they're soliciting public comment on. Of course, because they don't want it to be stopped. And they make it hard for regular citizens to do so. Even, but question for you, Lucian, is whether there's and I'm and this is now community board rules and, and whatever formal I'm gonna call it fuddy duddy stuff, but this is what we're bound by. Is there a way for us to make a comment, whether it's a chair's letter? Because I know I can't I, I I doubt I can do a resolution in this committee, but just to say that we would like to have an evaluation of the findings or whatever. I'm looking to see, you know, specific. We 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 are concerned about the decision of no significant impact, no significant impact in the FONSI. And um we don't we think that needs to be a full environmental assessment. And is that when, something when the MTA posted when 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 the federal government posted all of the draft analysis of yeah. impacts. And that's I'm, what Richie Torres in the Bronx was responding to in terms of the Cross Bronx Expressway yeah. showing that there would be increased traffic and you know as such there would be mm -hmm. times where traffic would not be moving and thus create yeah. more emissions in districts where there's actually uh, 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 significant uh, uh, populations of people of color, color and demographically, uh, economically uh, uh, far less uh, earning than this one, uh, that, there was a response there. And that was during that period. And that was the period where the federal government was certainly listening. And now that all that's completed, the federal government has moved to this phase. I think in my experience, and I'm not, you know, I'm trying not to say anyone's wrong or right here, but what I'm what I'm trying to say here is this is a lot of commentary that's come at beyond the tail end of this process. And I do not think that it's not a tail end government of the process, will... though. It's actually part of the process to have like a second fine tooth comb for someone to raise their hand. We are not at the end of the process. We are still part of the process. And this to be is, quite this candid, is the final part. to be quite candid, I have screenshots from some of these 160 residents who actually point blank asked Tammy and the head of the BPCNA about congestion pricing in 2022. If you want me to add the screen grab in the chat, I will, or I can circulate it. And there are pleas were ignored by the community board to to be a, a sounding board or to be representing the public comments at the MTA. And that is what is in ire. That is why we that, that is why it's 160 people asking right now in the process and it's not done yet. This is part of the process. But when Lucian, you say that it's the end, you're you're putting another um, self self-fulfilling prophecy or a limiting belief, a self-limiting belief in what we can and cannot change about this program. Uh, look, I'm sorry that that bad news is not coming uh, uh, welcome. But this when I describe this as the tail end, not telling okay, okay, wait, 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 you, wait, 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 Elizabeth, I know you're when upset. I, a, you can't yell at us. You can't a, yell at Lucian. This isn't Connor. This I'm, is not I'm, going I'm to do it. I'm describing this as the tail don't. end of the process. That is an accurate description of where we are. Did you look at the NEPA that I sent you in the in the chat? Page 27. Okay, so then. I would say reach out to Dan Goldman's office. That's who we need to talk to. Or him to do something extraordinary to turn the, the 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 EPA and the Federal Highway Administration and all these agencies against you know the the the, the findings that they put forth. That you're welcome to do that. It's within your rights. And I'll just put one more thing out there. I think texting Tammy and asking her to do everything is you i think you put on her radar but i think that there's a lot of things uh additionally that you can do and not dump everything on one member of one community board to solve all your oh problems oh my god you. that is not even what happened i don't think it's fair well, I, to, to sorry, say that you texted tammy about it 
I and I think that I didn't say there's, that. there's no, committee. I, oh, wow. We have screen this is... I'm just saying it's not, it's my last meeting, so I can be more candid than I usually am. I don't think it's fair. And I think that no, um, there's Tammy a lot of ways to even, engage. She did not sign. I am not speaking on behalf of Tammy. Tammy did not sign the 160. She's not part of the 160 residents, although she probably does live in Battery Park City. She did not sign. She did not sign the 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 the, uh, the survey. Tammy did did no part of the work that we have done as a cohort here. What we asked Tammy was to give us a seat at the table to be heard, and she refused. Oh, Betty, has anyone come to the transportation committee meeting in yes. the last year to talk about uh, congestion pricing? You can unmute yourself. From Battery Park City. Are you talking about this particular person or Battery Park City or in general? Any of the groups, uh, any to discuss anything congestion pricing wise? Everybody the public does come and raise issues. Been there, but this talk we had exactly yesterday. Yes, we had the, okay. we had this conversation yesterday, and it was determined that we couldn't do a resolution because not everybody had the ability the, because of the open meeting laws. There are people who, I agree with you, there are people who don't, and they should be able to be here too. And if we don't put it on the agenda, whether they read it or not, I don't know, but at least if we put it on that's the right. agenda, we give them the opportunity to show up, and that's the problem. And we don't have time. Um, that said, I think Lucian gave us a good nugget of information. This is federal. We need to speak to Dan Goldman. He's our representative. Um, and that's who this maybe this this um uh, your 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 God help me, what's this called? Your, the comments and, and also your your petition. Um that would go to Dan Goldman to say, hey, change your position because his position was this is great, let's move it forward. Jeff, go ahead. Just <clears throat> I haven't um focused on this particular environmental assessment because it was handled in the transportation committee, but I've done a lot of them on other issues. Um, I think the misunderstanding is the comment period and the, and the NEPA guide are talking about uh, describe a process where you make comments on the draft environmental assessment or the draft environmental impact statement. It was a public comment period and People in the community board, in fact, did make comments on the draft environmental assessment. There was and another letter that was with that was issued in May, uh, less than 45 days ago, saying that they are starting the NEPA process again for this particular uh, for this Fonzie document and a call for public comment. I have that letter too that I can show you. We are with. Oh the well, if well, if you have that, then yes, submit I the do. comments I do. to the. Then, then submit the comments to the place. Yes, that they... I, I do, and and that's why it's been so frustrating because I've, I've I've given this information to Tammy, and I've given it to anybody who would listen, and you know, like I just I don't know what more to do, and I feel like I'm getting a canned script that isn't really paying attention to really what's being said and where the process is, you know. So I can I I'm, I'm going to look for it now, and I will. I will send it to you. Um, it's, I had it in my WhatsApp and I'm on a computer. So I'm, um, Justine, if I put it in the WhatsApp, can you add it to the chat? Thank you. Um, um, I don't know that I have the power to do it from one place to the other, not because I can't, you know, not because I don't want to, but because I'm technically inept. Okay. Well, I mean, if, if there, if there is a new, I, I had the public comment period was closed on this, as is usually the case when the environmental assessment, the final, is issued, which has been issued in this case. But if it's been reopened for yep, some reason, it has, it, and we are in the NEPA process of the Fonz for the Fonzie, and the letter came out in May 2023, less than 45 days ago. We are in the so 45 I, day Jeff, period. I did see, I did see that letter. I cannot. I'm well, trying to find. I should it. also give a caveat that this is not the committee to address. I know. No, I was on it yesterday. I know. That's the problem. Uh, I'm not that committee. I was on it uh, yesterday, but, and I, I mean, we're, and we're, I got unfounded pushback. I'm certainly not a fan of the congestion pricing program for a whole host of reasons, but the Battery Park City Committee is not an appellate committee of the Transportation yeah. Committee. I mean, we're just not the we're just the wrong committee uh, to to address so this issue. So then Tammy telling me to, to speak here too is not fair because I'm trusting my community board to tell me where I should be directed and it's not fair. It's not fair. And, and <laughs> I read the bylaws of 
of community board one, and this would count as an emergency. And it was I was not heard. I was not heard. I'm finding this letter. I don't want. I don't want. I, don't want I, to I found it, but I can't put it in the chat. Maybe. I, I, I I can I can do it. I'm at. Can the you toilet. send it? If you can send me the link to the letter, in the chat, I can look at it. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna send an email email it to you if I think Jeff it's it's a letter that I have. I think just uh, not to Jeff, I mean Lucian. It's important just to speak a little bit about community board one. Community board one is governed by open meetings law. Uh, community board one uh, does it's require here, it's seventy two hours. That I found, it's on the bottom. Wait, wait, listen to what he's saying. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Thank you, Liz. Go ahead, Lucian. Community board one is required to post uh, agenda items 72 hours in advance. Um, I think giving both both committees uh, a chance to speak um, is a courtesy, um, but it does not, uh, it should not be a voting item uh, because of those reasons. If you had come uh, requesting this, you know, further than 72 hours in advance, I think that'd be a different discussion. But if, if if it doesn't go on the agenda, if it's not posted to the public, then it certainly should not be a voting item uh, because then it would be subject to a legal challenge. And it would certainly would be uh, a poor uh, uh, poor performance by the board. Um, so, you know, that's, I, I wanna make that clear. We can't just do things willy nilly. Um, so let me read this letter. Really uh, I, I, there's actually I, an explicit letter. This is the this is the notice of the the, the public commenting period that ends June twelfth. But there's no, actually no, 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 no. that's not what it what I'm reading. It's no. A, there's an actual explicit letter. There's an explicit. Letter. I sent, I texted it to you, Jeff. You texted it to me. It's an yeah. explicit letter. Let's see if I can copy. Uh, let's see. I placed it in the chat for everyone. Oh, thank you, Lucian. Um, so, I, what I'll no, say no, is no, that's that, not the explicit letter, Lucian. That's, that's not it. That's the only no, one I know. That's not the letter. The letter. You? There is an actual letter. There's a letter. I have to find it. This is the one that's dated May fifth. It is, and then there, and then there are three drafters of the Fonzie. That two of them are in our area. Ironically, there is an actual explicit letter. Calling this, for comments. Federal Highway Administration reviewed the the FONSI, right? That's the federal no final environmental assessment submitted in April. No, this and approves this, its release. Not it. that's, that's not that's, it. That's not it. There's an actual okay. letter. I don't have that one. I don't think I've ever seen that one because this one. I, the, the materials that I'm looking at indicate that there's a period of public availability that it ends June 12th, but it says nothing about. No, it it triggered. That triggered the NEPA process, which well, the is the, NEP, the NEPA process has been going on for a long time. No, I know it's a process that happens with many. It's just the part of the process, right? But it 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 said that they are triggering the forty five day commenting period as required by NEPA. That will okay, end. I don't see that. There's a letter. I, I, I have the letter. I'm just a little frazzled right now because I've been working furiously hard. And Lucian, you just met me, but to allege that Tammy did all this work is is just no i don't think that's what he was saying i think what he was saying what, what okay just i'm yeah, just yeah, no no this is you and that's it what he's saying is that tammy has been working on this issue for three years the, at least the entire board has been working yeah. on this issue since i started which is five years um the, you know since bloomberg's plan was floated by uh this board has been active and discussing this issue I it's not a new issue I understand. I just need to find um, the letter so that you guys can see when the NEPA process was triggered for this Fonzie document. Um, please bear with me because I've been working with um, several folks who volunteered to go through the red lines and I'm just So I know you've referenced that letter, um, but at the end of the day, as you're looking, keep looking. Okay. At the end of the day, um, I don't know that a, a, another resolution. You have the resolution. You know where the community board stands. We support 
I think we support pretty much everything you're saying. The only so, thing that is explicitly not mentioned in the resolution the, is is be, because the, the font environmental is, impact is yeah. new is a new document. So they've already said that they've taken into consideration all the comments that have happened prior. So they're going to say, well, we already considered it. So what we need is a new timestamp on something saying we need a new reevaluation now that this Fonzi, this finding of no significant impact has been presented to the public. The public disagrees. It needs to reevaluate these parts of the Fonzi in terms of environmental and economic injustice, right? So 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 that's where we are in the process right now. And 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 I'm so I'm so trying to find this letter right now. Um yeah, I, I don't think I ever saw anything. Maybe it was in emails, though. No, it was it, in the WhatsApp chat. Yeah, I, I have it. It's on. Um, it's in the WhatsApp chat, but it's very long. This WhatsApp WhatsApp chat is very long. It's very long. <laughs> it's very long. Um, and it's just a letter, or it's a link to a letter. It's a letter. It's it's a screen grab of the letter. Chris Marty letter. No, it's Washington Street. No. Yeah. It's a letter. Um, um, would this be something Lucian, if in fact, she was so inclined that that the chair I could write it. up, I found it. You found it. Okay, good. There. Thank you. There you go. There is the letter May 5th, 2023. The Federal Highway Administration reviewed the final environmental assessment EA for the Central Business District tolling program submitted on April 25th, 2023 and approves its release to the public for a 30 day public notice. The CBDTP must complete the NEPA process as a condition to applying for the FHWA value pricing pilot program. We are in comment right now based on the NEPA process. I'm going to put the link in the chat for everyone else, but I still don't see anywhere where it's soliciting comments from the public. The NEPA well, says process proves its release to the public for a 30 day public notice. What's the point of a, and I swear she's going to come in and I'm going to just say it. Why have a public notice if we can't say anything about it? The NEPA process is a commenting process. No. NEPA <laughs> is a commenting process. The, 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 the NEPA process has been ongoing for a long time. All of this was done pursuant to NEPA and the comment process typically is in connection with the draft environmental assessments and, and, uh, and the finding of no significant impact. These are, these are final statements and I, they're not, no, you can ask Congress why they gave this notice period at all. I presume it's to give an opportunity to sue before it's finalized. If you disagree with how they took into account. The, the the comments. Uh, I'm not saying this as, as an expert because I'm not an expert. I'm just if you look at if you look at the link of NEPA and how to how to no I did I I I have that page twenty seven. I mean I, I cannot be more clear. We are in a commenting process. It just has a name. It's called NEPA. So the question is, where do you want to send this to? What what is your what is your resource? Like, where do we send it? We are going to send this to Allison DeSereno, Nicholas A. Chuba, William Carey. We are going to send it to the Department of Transportation, Federal Highway Administration. We're going to send it to people who, who are, who have just. We're you also everyone. want to send it to Dan Goldman. So I think that what Lucian said makes sense because this is the federal federal highway administration. We need to be pestering the federal government, not the city or state government. No, but, but, but because you guys represent the constituency in which the local roads and areas will affect, we need all of our representatives to be in lockstep and say, hey, we're going to raise our hands with these constituents and these citizens. We want this to be reevaluated because there's a white space in the study around this particular area. There's no mention of it. All right, I hear you now. I think that everybody is clear what you're saying. Is that a fair statement? People on the board? My board? You understand her point, yes? All right, so what do you want to do? Think if anything. The comment period is closed. So uh, you think we can't make a comment? Anybody can make a comment, but it's not going to have an effect. 
because the comment period is closed from what I read in front of me. It's, no. Okay, so the qu next question is, do we make a comment anyway? Yes, I, I don't said think this I, committee. Can... <laughs> I, 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 Elizabeth, this has to be for our committee now, okay. and we have to decide. Then the answer is, no, I mean, I'll see how our committee can weigh in on this. I don't, I call. don't see and either. I think but... it would be counterproductive for the community board to make a Battery Park City specific comment on this because although there are certainly many problems, and I do not favor this congestion pricing program at all, as many of you know, but the the issues. Battery Park City is hardly unique, as well as hardly the most sympathetic of the complainers in terms of other people are treated a lot worse than we are uh, by this program. Um, but, you know, the community board has commented on congestion pricing already. If the board through at the executive committee or wherever else wants to <clears throat> address whether additional comments are appropriate, the board could certainly do that. But it's just completely out of the jurisdiction of the Battery Park City Committee. It came up actually last night that executive would still be too late because full board is too late. They're going to start installing equipment on the 13th of the month. This was the unfortunate part. Lucian, go ahead. Yeah, no, 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 um, no resolution can be passed without full board unless it's an emergency circumstance, in which case you could call an executive committee meeting ahead of that time to pass something and then later be ratified by the full board. But I, you know, in my, um, and I know that is not going to like this, but I don't believe this meets that criteria. And furthermore, I would ask, I would have the board ask Dan Goldman's office to clarify this point about NEPA and where we are in the process so that the board is crystal clear as to, you know, what it means. I think Jeff uh, is likely right that this is an opportunity for someone to stop an action through legal means. It's also, you know, pre-internet. Um, and, and, and maybe even pre FOIL or FOIA for the federal government, this was a way for people to actually see the document at all um, before, was, you know, the days of posting on the web pages came about. Um, so um, I don't, I don't think that uh, there's a place for a resolution here because I think it would violate open meetings law. I think this is the wrong jurisdiction for it. And I think that if the, if the executive committee would be the best place to take it up, given those realities, but only if what response you get from Goldman points you to uh, making it a worthwhile endeavor. Okay, next question for you is, um, could would could this be a chair's letter or something just to say we support this or that? But yeah, is that the, the chair's letter could could echo uh, previously established positions of the board. Um, which I believe is generally in disfavor of of uh, a, a blanket congestion pricing regime without any sorts of uh, uh, ways to make it a lighter uh, impact on residents who who use vehicles. Uh, however, that is not painting the picture that um, uh, this is uh, painting. Yeah, no, that is, is 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 asking for in that um, there's some sort of um, environmental. Uh, uh, they're ignoring certain environmental. Uh, realities uh, that may have a, a significant impact on communities in lower Manhattan. That's what is because being that alleged wasn't, here. So, question for you is: a letter, just re, you know, kind of from, by the by the chair, reiterating or, or referring back to our old stances on this would get us to some port. But again, would at least be a that's not really for the federal government. That's really for the. No. The mobility know, review board because they're the ones who are setting exemptions. That process is predicated on this being approved and exemptions, you know, being carved out by the transit mobility review board. She couldn't, she couldn't know, write it to, to to Goldman, Dan Goldman, or she couldn't saying write. that you you know that the the, the community board uh, doesn't favor congestion pricing and wants exemptions, but that's not really speaking to what's happening here. This is this is about environmental. Impact. Well, I think, and, yeah, and I don't. I, I don't think that it's matching what Elizabeth is asking for. Elizabeth has a question. Her hands up. Let her speak, because because she can't. What you're saying, Lucian, is um, so. Elizabeth, go ahead. You'll speak. But you're saying that Tammy can't go beyond what we've said in the past. In her she, no, she she ought to stay no. with the board's established position. 
Okay. Well, let's establish a position is outdated when they're asking for new comments based on the actual program being presented. Now, there was no program before last year or the year prior. This is a new document that they just drafted that requires new and timely comments and solutions as part of the NEPA process. There are environmental injustice considerations. There are economic injustice considerations, especially around how this would impact minorities and families. That is explicitly in but Elizabeth, that that doesn't help your argument here in this space. Oh, well, because I, I mean, I feel time. like I feel unfortunately, I, I feel it's like uh, it's a lost cause with this with this committee. I had the shot yesterday and I, you know, I, I just feel like no citizen in my shoes. And, and I, I am 1 voice, but I'm speaking for 160 of my neighbors should not uh -huh. turn away <laughs> in this way. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And, and, and it's, it's, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm being very candid right now because we are running out of time. Monday is the deadline. And so if it's not with the board, then, you know, I wanted to ask battery park city authority, Nick, like, is this something that. Is this something that battery park city authority can help us with from a, from a federal level to write a letter saying we would like to have further studies about how this would affect battery park city. Is that something that you can do? Well, Lick is thinking about that, Lucian. Go ahead, if he even heard you. Yeah, it's okay. the, I, the only point I want to make here is that community boards are not designed to act quickly. They're designed to be contemplative and give time for discussion. So, to I think to expect the community board to be able to turn this around and, and have a, a new position on this um, in light of its you know, statutory obligation I don't think is is a, 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 the same kind of organization that you have in mind. I think maybe a better fit for your argument is to ask for community-based organizations, which do not have a statutory obligation to act the same way that we do to issue letters of support. You can ask elected officials who are not required to move as slowly as we are to take stances that support yours. Um, but unfortunately, the community board is by design supposed to move slowly and that, you know, hair and fire issues just don't don't really um, are, are not satisfied by the way that it works. And that's why that's just how it's supposed to be. And I, and it, I know it, it isn't a good fit. And sometimes it, we can't address issues that are of importance. Uh, because of the time sensitivity of those issues. So what, what does emergency um, but, mean but can, in the bylaws? What does well, emergency I mean? mean? To be, even as an emergency, I mean, you're you're talking about, you know, there's still things that you have to do, like, you know, pulling an executive committee meeting together. I mean, you can't just, even if this committee could uh, do a resolution, it would still need to be ratified. It can't just go out and then just you know, mean something. So if a hundred people in this neighborhood said that this congestion pricing will drive them out of being able to afford living here, and we have three days to comment on other issues that that 160 neighbors have commented on, that's not into consideration. No, no, honestly, no, not a hundred people, and not unless you ask the assembly person and the senator to change open meetings law and have it signed by the government governor. To allow us to do that at the timetable that you're hoping for. It's just not something that we can do. And it's, it's inconvenient and it's, a, and I know it's a, it's a letdown, but for this board to act appropriately and within the law, it shouldn't be, you know, passing something in a committee with dubious open meeting law implications and then passing that off as something that's supported by the full board. It simply isn't. It simply isn't because it's not going through the, the proper procedures elaborated by the bylaws by the city charter and by open meetings law. And and it it's not the answer you're looking for, but unfortunately it's the way that the board All right, so then work. then I need then I need since you're so, you know, educated on this Lucien, then what what do we do because it, with or without a community board resolution, um I already have the, you know, I already have city council member Marte is going to draft a letter by tomorrow. I've spoken I've spoken with the assembly Assemblyman's office, uh, Charles Fall's office, and they, you know, are, are supportive of this because they are also introducing bills based on our, 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 our data and our survey as well. So, I mean, like, I, I, with or without the community board's blessing, which is really disappointing. 
very disappointing that this was raised over a year ago and it took me asking Chris Marte on Thursday and me doing the due diligence overnight and me taking time off of my work for five days and me collecting 200 surveys and me fighting all this pushback to just get to this point. It's very disappointing that I don't have the backing of the community board and I really call for an innovation of the community board process. I call for a pivot in the way that this has happened because we're going to lose important issues that 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 are, are going to adversely affect families in our neighborhood. You know, and that's not fair. That's not fair. I, yeah, I, so you asked for my recommendation. I think yeah. um you know, Jeff brought up some good points about NEPA. There were periods of this process where our feedback could have been helpful no, no, according no, no. to the argument. I, 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 and I, oh wait, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Um, if, without having brought to, you know, uh, uh, a committee meeting, a discussion about the blind eye that the report has turned towards the potential environmental impacts of Battery Park City. Um, your last recourse, you know, given that we are really not able to, to respond to your request, is to also get the support of Dan Goldman's office. And then it would also be very helpful to get the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senator Gillibrand's office also. Those are the most important, but you know, having CBO letters doesn't hurt. And also for all the 160 people to send their own comments as well individually. You did. We I don't them. believe I, I don't believe your episode. your efforts are in vain. I think that I applaud your efforts to to read into government reports and be responsive. I just am hoping that in the future, and this is not a, a knock on you or your efforts, but just know that there are many ways to get things in front of the community board. Coming to a committee, you don't have to only have the chair bless it. I would invite you to come to a meeting and just say, this is something that should be on the agenda in the future. And a committee can put it on its own agenda. Um, there's, and so I, I, I encourage that. So I think everyone here is applauding your efforts to protect your community in ways that you see fit. And I hope you continue with that enthusiasm. Well, I do, because I do it's want very to show good. one more thing in the chat. I do want to show one more thing on the record in the chat. So let me just show just so that we're not told that we didn't try to flag this at all because we totally did. We, we a hundred percent did as a community, but we were not, you know, the process is very convoluted. It's hard for people to understand. Right? So, I don't know. I mean, I just sent a screen grab asking Tammy directly in August of 2022, what can be done? And we were not guided and we were ignored. But in oh. August. 2002 wasn't the common period over at that point. I don't know. No, it wasn't. I, I, I really don't think we should be. Yeah. Kind of no, but you're saying you're saying you're saying that is you're not asking, was not okay, meant to be. Public. Again, also, I'm only speaking on behalf of the 160. I wasn't there last year. I was only here this year. I, I'm just I'm representing what people want me to represent in this meeting and I'm I am don't shoot the messenger. I'm just want to put it on record. Okay. But I also, I also want to say, Elizabeth, and, and I appreciate this because number one, I think that it's clear that, um, I agree with you. It, it's, it's not over till it's over. Um, right. and I, I believe that it's worth turning over stones. This right. community board is, I'm going to say it. If, in fact, it's a dead end to yesterday and today, it doesn't mean that it's that the whole process is done. We are one just one voice oh, and the that. people who are on here. We could, we can do more and, um, know. you know, I, I guess something that I get very frustrated about is hearing um, the criticism of the community board because each and every single 1 of us spend hours. Of our days, hours of our weeks and months and years on this community board and on issues for this neighborhood. And there are things that we are doing all the time that are beyond just 1 issue. So, um, it's a little, I think what Lucian's trying to do in defending Tammy or defending the community board is. We are, we are, we're all volunteers too, right? I, I understand. This is, this is something that we're trying to do to try to take care of as many people as possible and we're doing the best that we can. Um, I will tell you that 
And I respect every single person, whether I agree with them or not. I respect every single person's commitment. And I definitely respect all the work you've put into this the last minute um, because it has been a ton of work the past few days just based on the WhatsApp chat alone. I haven't um, slept. I haven't seen my kids. I've told these 160 neighbors and it grows that I promise that we will be heard. And I have a responsibility. You, you have been heard. It doesn't being heard doesn't mean that they're going to listen to us because this is Correct. something that I personally have been screaming about regularly whenever I possibly had the chance because I have been against this from day one. Correct. I Every mean, single chance I've had to step up and complain. So I appreciate your frustration. Believe me, I appreciate your frustration. Well, and I think it's um, important. And, and and I spoke to several people who said it was important to be candid about our frustrations with the the process, you know, on a local level. But also from a federal level, and and but, but you, yeah, and 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 you're right. No stone unturned. Yeah. I no matter what, even if it even if it's if it, you know, June twelfth is our deadline to make a comment. As far as I'm concerned, we are going to make sure we have comments in, whether yeah. it's effective or what. At least we try because it's a hail mary. You try, it you is. don't try. You know what I mean? Even you got to try. Hail mary, I you gotta totally try. agree with you. You got to try, and you got to try in ways that that are possible the problem with the community board is it's bigger than just one or two committees and it's a, there's processes and when lucian says that we're not fast we don't pivot fast because we have to get everybody's input and emergency excuse me emergency meetings stuff like that we just don't do that because people are volunteers you do emergency meetings at work uh you know you could do that stuff but but when it's volunteers people can't be there and if they can't be there you can't get it done so um, that's where you're getting and getting hitting up against our brick wall but that does not mean that the community board or anybody here is telling you stop so what i want to say now is i'm going to call this discussion to a close right now because this is getting late and we've been doing this for a long time your voice has been heard your petition has been on the record in two committees I just cannot tell you how much I respect all the work and effort you've done. Um, and it's not over till it's over and let's keep talking and anybody here on this who's on this call. Who's and listening I, to this? Well, who's listening to this? You know, what we're saying now we'll listen to it later. The chat and the links are there. Sign the petition. If you believe with it, what it says, get out there and join in with what they're doing, because this is the Hail Mary play and you've raised some issues. I don't know if it's going to work. But you know what? Only reason why you know it's never going to work is if you don't try. Right. Correct. I believe that. And, and I believe that 100%. So and I want to thank you, Justine, for, for giving me the platform and in being welcoming to it and understanding the process and how quickly it came together. Lucien, I know you don't know me. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm saying this passionately because it's been such a hot fire button issue. And I have heard very sad stories from my neighbor. I grew up here. I've lived in Battery Park City since 1985. My parents had the first school bus for me in 1987. I love this neighborhood. I want to protect my family that I raise here. The New York Times did a whole article about me in Battery Park City. So like I I am doing this with so much love and 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 commitment to my community. And so if I don't want you to mistake my ire or my passion for anything, but that we have a deadline on Monday and I want to knock down walls and figure out how to get these comments heard because we're not even considered. Our neighborhood is not even mentioned in this document. And that is an oversight, a big one, because we are trapped by the West side highway. Yep. Well said. Thank you, Elizabeth. Right, thank um, you. I think that we are done with this with our agenda. Is that correct? And we're done with the new business. I think yes. we can call this meeting to a close. So I'd like to say at this point in time, once again, Lucian, going out with a bang. Um, thank you. And yes, put your baby to sleep, Eric. So cute. <laughs> Haven't been able and had a chance to say that, but so beautiful and so big. All right. And um no, you're welcome. And um I just Yes, we can turn the recording off if you want, whatever, but I just can't thank you enough. Yes, thank you, Lucian. You're all, all right. very, very welcome. Thank you. Recording is.